on. Somebody help him out. <laughs> you got to go to 11.50 on a microphone. Tonka on 11. Uh, while we're talking about electronic communications, would you please all mute your phones so that we don't have any interruptions, beeps, or clicks, or stars and stripes forever? Silence to remember Mike Stone, uh, who recently passed away. Uh, the husband of Sue Stone, who's been a, uh, a long-time distinguished teacher at Newburyport High School. Thank you. Now the pledge of allegiance. Call the order. In my pleasure, Mr. President. Councilor Harquist. Present. Councilor Hearsaw. Here. Councilor Kinsey. Here. Councilor Tonto. Present. Councilor Vogel. Present. Councilor Cameron. Present. Councilor Connell. Present. Councilor Cronin. Present. Councilor Eigerman. Here. Councilor Junta. Present. Councilor O'Brien is absent. We have a quorum. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any late file items? There are two late file items, Mr. President. The first one is a communication number three, Council will see on their desk, with respect to the chocolate tour. And there's a second late file, which is an order number two on in street. My understanding it's a confirmatory order, page and book change. Uh, but those are the two. What is the will of council? Motion with the will with respect to those late file items. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So let's insert those two items in the appropriate uh, places in your agenda. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Mayor Donna Holliday, uh, who's here to give the Stephen City address. Well, after three tries of trying to schedule this on a Monday night, I think we're finally here. So. A lot has been happening in the city over the last couple weeks, and a lot has happened in the city over the last year. But we're going to keep this uh, short and sweet and get through, because obviously there's a, a lot of interest in the agenda items here tonight. So city councilors, Superintendent Vaccaro, Vice Chair Cheryl Sweeney, my department heads, your department heads, uh, welcome uh, to the state of the city. What is the state of our city? Go ahead. <laughs> that's, an inefficient, that's an inefficient way of doing it. Something, you know? something new or different that uh, none of us are used to dealing with. But um, in particular, I, I wanted to just ask uh, Tony Finari, and if any, is Wayne with you tonight or is he? No, he's managing snow. Yeah, so Tony, please stand up. And I would ask all of us. <laughs> the next time you get a standing O's is your retirement, Tony, so <laughs> enjoy this one. <laughs> well, I'm afraid if we have another winter like that, we might. But for those of you who, aren't, who don't know, Tony is our uh, Director of Public Services. He oversees water, sewer, and highway. And with uh, Wayne Amaral and his amazing staff who have worked day in, day out, have done everything they can to try and keep our city clear. One of the things that was very helpful was given the amount of snow that Nor Newburyport experienced, which was after this last blizzard of 10 feet, we were able to get 
additional help from um, the governor's office and NEMA. We had uh, crews in from Pennsylvania DOT with, um, who came with eight trucks and a front loader and or five trucks, eight guys and a front loader. We had a crew in from Maryland, from New York and from Northern Tree. Without that level of support, I'm not sure our city would look as good as it does. And I know we get the calls that there are still many streets that need to be taken care of, um, including mine, Tony, but um, <laughs> we, will, we will get there and all of us just need to be patient. I think we've done an awful lot and if you have any doubt about how much snow <coughs> we have accumulated, I'm asking you to look at Mount Cashman here. Um, <laughs> and that was probably not even before we had this last additional two feet. So, um, and I, I, Ed, thank you for posting that picture. I, I just love that one. But what I wanted to take a minute about and to talk about were these two pictures here. Um, this is uh, the cans on Plum Island. The sewer system on Plum Island is failing. It's an air vac system, it's a vacuum pressure system, it's in real trouble. Um, not sure at this juncture that it should ever have been put out there, but it's what we're dealing with at this juncture. And we have these cans contain the controllers, the valves, and the plungers for, uh, that are activated to push the sewer into the vacuum system once you flush your toilet. Uh, attached to, e to each of these cans are three candy canes, which are the sewer vents. Now those are white and they have been totally covered in 10 feet of snow and they need to be uncovered. We have a lot of neighbors who are out there working because there's only 40% 40 40 of the homes aren't occupied, helping to uncover these. And we are, uh, have crews in from Airbac who designed the system, who are working with us to try and deal with this mess. We relocated 55 families today. We have a whole group of services from NEMA uh, Red Cross who are at Pitta Hall. We'll be there again tomorrow to help wor work with families as we try and get the system back online. Our main issues are primarily down Northern Boulevard. Uh, on the outer side, there's two lines that run down Northern Boulevard. On the outer side is going to be the most challenging. On the ocean side, the inner side, we are having some luck. Um, the pressure should be about 22. I'm afraid to say what it is tonight because it's good, but we have a very deep freeze coming, so I'm not even gonna say it um, because it fluctuates all over the place. But again, uh, Jamie Tucolo and his crew deserve a tremendous amount of credit as well as all the support that they're getting from uh, the sewer department and also the water department. It's all hands on deck during this time. So I, I really appreciate the work that we're doing there. There are more detailed updates on the website if you're interested in learning more about what's going on on Plum Island. But it's, um, it's been a very challenging last uh, week, week and a half. So on a happier note, we began this year uh, kicking off our 250th anniversary. I am very grateful to the Newburyport Bank, the Institution for Savings, New England Development, who also all contributed as well as the state to help fund activities for our 250th. So many agencies across the entire city st started organizing events. The Custom House had their first Fridays and special events, which is over here. Um, the Then and Now photographic book that was put together um, also, which was a wonderful, our big clan bake out on Plum Island. The Archival Center uh, did an amazing um, job of bringing out all of some of the most important documents we have in the city and sharing those. Uh, the Daily News put together this great book and I had lots of fun as a ship captain being pushed in the bed race. So I know Ed joined us on that too. So lots of events that happen. We still would like to finish our flag and our time capsule. Uh, we just got a little bit delayed with uh, dealing with snow. So let's talk about what we've accomplished in the, the capital projects this past year. I think our, our greatest accomplishment that we've had this year that we can all be so proud of is our school projects. This is um, the Bresnahan School where uh, former treasurer is there, our, our legislators there, Susan Vaccaro, uh, our school committee members as we cut the ribbon uh, for opening up uh, the Bresnahan School. Uh, this is what the media center looks like here. This is our beautiful terrazzo floors that will last 50 years. And that are two beautiful playgrounds out in the back. They're being used by the in entire community. Brand new school, pre-K through three. And uh, it's just exciting to see the enthusiasm of teachers and students. 
Knockmullen was also renovated. Uh, there's some <coughs> landscaping work and accessibility work that was done, some work to the gym. This is the showpiece that I want to talk about, though. This was, this is the Diary of a Wimpy Kid that they did, um, uh, had the uh, author there who did a great uh, presentation for the students. But the, with the help of the NEF and, of course, all of the residents of Newburyport, we came in under budget on time on both projects and we were able to use the money to uh, upgrade this gorgeous auditorium and the students just did a magnificent production of The Wizard of Oz. We will be doing a formal rib ribbon cutting in March sometime. All the windows were replaced as well as all kinds of systems. But what's exciting about what happened with the schools as a result of these projects, not only do we have uh, the best superintendent that we've had in a really long time in our schools who is doing a terrific job leading Susan. Could you stand up for a minute? I'd like to introduce Susan Vaccaro for those of you who might not have the pleasure of meeting Susan. And, uh, uh, her right arm aide is here with us too. Assistant superintendent of curriculum is Angela Bick. If you could please stand also. Appreciate you being here. Together, we're together as with school committee members and her leadership team introducing wonderful new curricula, um, this uh, Engage New York math program. With the school projects, we've been able to introduce almost $2 million of new technology, which brings us up to a 1 to 1.1 ratio of device to kid. We were at 1 to 13 before. I mean, we were, in, we were in the dark ages. If you ever saw what they were pulling out of the old Bresnahan school before they knocked it down, Remember those old monitors that were like this deep? Was, we were so far behind uh, the ball. So it's very exciting. Our technology is going in the right place. Our leadership team is in the right place. We also have created these special um, therapeutic models within each of our schools to begin advancing our uh, special education services, which is really important uh, for our school community and be able to provide the kinds of supports our children need in our, their own communities. So we're very excited about that. Also, uh, as I said, about the curriculum, the technology, and so I'm just, oh, we're also working on very strong new partnerships with higher ed. So that's also very exciting. Um, as you know, as you come down High Street, this is the centerpiece of High Street, is our, our gorgeous high school. And we were having lots of trouble with all of the uh, wood here. And so thank you to the uh, CPC, Community Preservation Committee, who allocated money last year so that we could repair and maintain the, the beautiful wood of our magnificent high school. And of course, uh, since the passage of the Older Americans Act, we have been fighting about a senior community center. This is our senior community center, and this is what it's going to look like in September. Roseanne Robillard, I told her she can't retire until she finally has her senior <laughs> center. Could you please stand up? Roseanne runs our council on aging. And absolutely does a magnificent job and always smiling, even if she has to run activities in 27 sites across the city. <laughs> Think how wonderful it will be to have all of our activities for seniors and supports and services under one roof. Ralph Castagna, local contractor, has the contract there and things are going well. I'm sure they're a little behind schedule with this weather, but I'm sure they'll catch up. A um, couple other things, the Brown School is we're evaluating if we have other additional educational needs. Uh, that was a request of the school committee. We've also had Winter Street architects from Salem come in and do a feasibility study that's posted on the website. We're beginning to figure out what makes the most sense uh, for the reuse of this building, adaptability. Uh, we've talked about artist studios, we've talked about mixed use, some senior housing, affordable housing. And it's important, the community wants it not to just turn into something like a James D. Mill, which is also something needed in our community, but that's not an interactive space or property in the community. There's a playground, basketball court, so we're trying to figure it out. So uh, we'll continue to have community meetings and, and work with uh, ward counselors and other counselors around what to do there. But one thing that's been incredibly successful is that youth services have moved in there, and what a great space for them. They're using the gym, they're using all, uh, four classrooms, they have a lot more space, they're a lot happier there. Um, and we're just trying to still work on traffic and parking. <coughs> Snow, I have to keep saying that word. Uh, the Kelly School, this is exciting. I know that this was hard when we decided to close our neighborhood schools 
and we had to make some tough decisions about educating our children. And so one of the things that uh, happened was we closed the Kelly School. It was really a cost inefficient building built in the 1890s, 70s, 80s, I don't know, it's really old. Um, and it was um, needed, the bricks needed to be repointed. It was, we couldn't use the second floor. It had no handicap accessibility. You know, it was a really a tough building for us to try and keep up. But we know how important it is to our community and the fact that it was one of the first schools and so we have a historic preservation easement on the front of the building. So even though the building was recently sold and we're working on a purchase and sale agreement with Diamond and Senecori, I said that correctly, Andy, thank you. Um, we're uh, meeting actively with them to work out a purchase and sale. There will be 10 high-end condos uh, in the building with underground parking. Yes, they will be able to do underground parking underneath the Kelly School. So um, that's an exciting project. We sold the building, or the price that we have on the table is 750000 and anything over 20% in terms of what they make, we will get 50% of that as an added bonus. So uh, Central Waterfront, again, a um, lot of work has been done there. We completed the bulkhead project, as you can see here. This was some of the initial work that was done that was needed. This was through a $1.9 million grant from the Seaport Advisory Council. We still have more work to do, and I'm grateful to the City Council who helped make up some gap funding we had there. Uh, new floats been put in, were put in um, by the Harbor Commission, which is wonderful. Uh, we have a very active and growing boating community, and this is ultimately uh, our new transient boater facility that we are hoping to hear about a federal grant, the boating infrastructure grant in April uh, to move forward on beginning to develop that project for our community and boaters. And of course, rail trail phase two. Again, I am thank you to the city council who helped with some gap funding uh, in your passage last week. Uh, this is something that I think our community really, really uses. We did a spotlight check uh, of usage last July, and it was a thousand people on a Saturday around noon. A thousand people. So we know. Don't, 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 don't crush me along here. So, did it seem like I was in there? <laughs> <laughs> I said a half an hour, I still got 10 minutes. Um, so. The, this part of the rail trail has been much more complicated because it's longer and it runs from um, the uh, train station over Parker, through Marches Hill, Bromfields, under High Street, this is that piece here, along the old abandoned railroad bed, along um, Bromfield Street, pops out again, then comes along the river and connects ultimately to the other end. So there's a lot of easements, there's companies, there's National Grid, there's the Coast Guard, there's just a lot more um, challenges to this piece. But I would also like to recognize uh, Lise Reed, if you would please stand up. Um, she's been, Jordy's not here, who is the designer behind all of this, but this is the person who makes it all work and run. <laughs> In addition to our parks. And then this is the next piece that Lisa's been working on. Again, grateful to the CPC and Restore and the Institution for Savings who brought funding together to help us finally stop looking at this deplorable, collapsing, stadium at the high school and uh, those of you who have students who will be graduating um, you won't have to take pictures behind crumbling stadiums uh, in the future uh, this is what our new stadium uh, a rendering of that it's uh, going out to bid and i'm very excited that um, the timing was perfect when all this issues about crumb rubber came up about the synthetic turf and people came together and said wait a minute what are we going to do about synthetic turf so we have uh, through the work of lease and all of her team found this envirofill, which is sand as opposed to the crumb rubber that they will be using, and it's colored, and it's going to be wonderful. It's a little more expensive, but we've been pretty good at filling those funding grap gaps, and it's also, from what we understand, uh, much, much more safer in kinds of health issues that were being raised with the crumb rubber we won't have to deal with. So thank you for all that work. And then we have the Knock Mullen Field, as most people know, and especially people who play baseball, that we displaced one of the baseball fields, one of our three baseball fields we only had, um, when we built the new Bresnahan Elementary School. So uh, there was a real need to create a new full-size, uh, varsity-size baseball field. And thank you to the City Council, once again, who were instrumental in agreeing 
to allow us to have a special election to use a balance of the funding on the Bresnahan School uh, for this is one of the field projects for North Mullen and the second is for upgrades to the track at Fuller Field. Another um, important project that just has gone through all the permitting is the DPS building. Uh, we are really out of space down on Six Perry Way and are in need of new facilities for uh, all these guys who do amazing work as the, they're the heart and soul of our city, I always say, who are keeping our city moving forward. So uh, we'll be moving forward on putting that new um, building together. Um, we received a grant from the Backyard schools, what? Common backyard. Common backyards, I was close. Um, <laughs> it was for $290,000. $200,000. Oh, well, give or take 90, okay. Um, <laughs> and it helps us, because a lot of people wanted to bring back the fountain on N Street, and we had a group of people who tried at one point, but it wasn't filtered enough and wasn't safe, so we had to shut it down <laughs> again. We've done some work on lighting the turrets, <coughs> and this is part of what we've done with paid parking revenues is that we've put it back into the downtown. So the next piece that we'll be working on probably September-ish is that after the summer season uh, and tourist season, we'll begin working on um, this fountain, which is just gonna look something like that, and we'll still be keeping the um, steamship pieces for historic purposes. Okay. These are examples, <laughs> examples of garages that we are looking at <laughs> that have potential to be compatible with Newburyport. So, do we have a design yet for a garage? No, this is an example. So I just wanna make that very clear. Uh, we were fortunate to, this is something we've been working on since 2000, before? Before, before, um, before. 99, before. I don't know, it's just, we've been working on this a garage for the city for forever. There's been numerous memorandums of understanding, understanding that have been made with the NRA that you have to build a garage before you can take parking off. And so we've been really working on trying to figure out how we can deal with traffic and, and an intermodal facility we really need in our, our garage in our city. Uh, we have uh, design money from the Merrimack Valley Regional Transit Authority and we're working with um, that group, and we were fortunate enough with the help of our former state rep, Mike Costello, mm -hmm. and uh, Senator Ives to get money, $5 million in the transportation bond bill, which sort of made its way around um, government and landed in the Mass DOT capital bond bill, and I've been trying to get the governor's attention to try and get that released. We're working with New England Development also because they own the property at where the old fitness factory or fuel is now, which is where the uh, site for the garage has been um, identified. Open space. Last year we were very fortunate to protect another piece of the Curzon Mill property. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and because of the money we have with the Community Preservation Act, we are able to take these important parcels of land in our community and protect them. This is the Colby Farm map that we're looking at right now. Um, there's various opinions on whether or not we should protect this or not, or part of it, or some of it, or all of it. So I have asked uh, planning to put together a meeting with planning, planning board, city council, open space committee, and am I missing anybody, Andy? Well, I said counselors. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with that, we can, we can figure out what we want to do uh, with, with that um, parcel. Affordable housing is something that is really, really, really important um, to my administration and I think to our city. We um, have a terrific affordable housing trust group that are all experts in housing that meet on a regular basis and they receive funding directly from the Community Preservation Act to have a pool of funding to be able to deal with affordable housing. This was um, the unit over on, um, complex over on Merrimack Street, uh, Merrimack Landing, that um, we wanted an affordable unit and he said he couldn't make the price point work. So with that funding, we were able to put some money on the table and be able to create one of the units as affordable. Uh, we have a lot more work to do in this area because we've been going backwards instead of forwards. Uh, we've been losing apartments at the foundry, at, at Woodman's, um, so we have to keep moving forward because it's important that seniors be able to stay in our community 
and it's important that our youth are able to afford something when they come to our community. So this is a very exciting project. Um, the councillors have the ordinance before them to develop a 40R. This is a smart growth district and this is, um, how many times did I push back on Minko? Five? Five. Six? I didn't like the design. I like this. I think they did a really nice job as they, they're moving forward <coughs> in terms of, of what this will look like. This will be right behind the train station. Um, and this is the map for what a smart growth district looks like here. And what happens is once we approve a 40R district, we get $600,000 immediately from the state. And then for each unit we open, we get $3,000. So it's a, a, it's a way of meeting our rental needs, our affordability needs, our transit-oriented development, smart growth. It matches with a uh, strategic plan that we had put in place quite a while ago for that section of the city from Story Ave down to the train station. And um, I'm really excited about, about this project moving forward. 80 units with 25% affordability. It's good. All rental. Then we're working on comprehensive zoning review, which hasn't been touched since 1987. And I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to introduce Andy Port yet, for those of you who don't know, our director of planning. Up. Oh. Thank you, Andy. And so that's, we're just, we were working with um, Community Opportunities Group, who is uh, our, um, won the bid to work with us on, on redoing our zoning. As I said, it hadn't been touched since 1997, <coughs> except for some individual crisis zoning changes as a result of something somebody didn't like. So we really needed to do this. And master plan revision. Our master plan is outdated. It, uh, it probably should have been updated several years ago, but again, it takes a lot of time and a lot of community input. And we're, we're moving forward and we took a little break uh, during the summer months and vacations and getting the schools up and opened and now we'll start meeting again. I think our next, me our next meeting is coming up uh, first week in March as we begin to move forward and, and put together all these 10 areas that are so important to our city. And I thank all the members of our community and city council who've sat on committees and continue to work with us to complete our master plan. If you have not been involved with our master planning process, please get involved. This is our vision for the city for the next 10 years. And then finance. We have done a really, really good job in terms of our finances. And I would like to recognize Ethan Manning, who is our finance director. And with, where's Peter? He's not even here. He's been working on Plum Island, he, so it's okay. He's um, up there with a shovel. Dan, <laughs> Dan Raycroft, who is our assessor, is a member of our finance team. Julie <laughs> Lamperin is around somewhere. Where is Julie? Our treasurer is here too. Uh, we also uh, have, there she is. Okay, hi Julie. Um, <laughs> we also, because our charter has been changed and now wants us to meet um, jointly with the, the school committee and the city council before we start the budget process. <coughs> we did that for the first time and it was a very productive meeting and I look forward to continuing that work. Uh, we have um, Susan Vaccaro as well as Nancy Lysick who is um, the budget person in the schools who now sit on our finance team. We have maintained a, a double A plus bond rating which is almost perfect, it's wonderful. Uh, we received the Government Finance Officer Award for Budget Distinction again this year. That's three years in a row. It's a very hard award to win. I'm very proud of that piece also. And this just talks about our projected general fund revenue. Obviously, the most of our revenue comes from property taxes. Uh, and you can read that chart as easily as I can read it to you. So, move on. Um, our general fund expenditures. As you can see, our schools take up 54% of the budget. Uh, then we talk a little bit about Whittier, planning, general, and this is how the pie breaks up for how we break up our budget. We have three enterprise accounts, which are fee-for-service accounts. It means that they pay, they're self-sustaining, they pay for themselves. So that's water, sewer, and harbor master. Our reserves are very healthy. Um, well, we haven't paid our snow bills yet, or. <laughs> relocation and everything <coughs> from Plum Island, but our reserves at this moment are really healthy. Uh, as you can see, the blue is free cash. That's the money that's left over at the end of the fiscal year. 
um, and it has been, you know, really been pretty steady and it's really important to us because it's helped us with our capital needs and we've had a lot of capital needs. Uh, our overlay reserve is the gold and then the red is our stabilization fund, which we've got to bump up a little bit because we have a, um, a policy that we will keep it at 5% of our general operating budget, so we'll get there shortly. And as you can see, I always like to put this one up because this is where we were with state aid back in uh, 08, 09 and with school funding. School funding has been creeping up, but our, our local aid is nowhere near where it was before. Um, and so that's why we needed to generate a couple more revenue streams, paid parking and meals tax has helped somewhat. And I, I think one of the um, best things that the city council had did during budget season last year was to support a grant writer. She has submitted over $2 million worth of grants since you have hired her and she's half time. Um, I d we'll give you more during budget process. We'll give you more details about which of those have been funded. And <coughs> but, it, it, you know, I, I think it, it was um, Council Ponto who said she, she gets one grant, she pays for her own salary. So um, it's been uh, really wonderful to have her. Um, this is uh, assessed values of our property. As you can see, there's a lot of strength in the property value in billions in our city. And uh, Dan Raycroft manages all of that. <coughs> Dan, please don't worry about it anymore. But yeah, Dan's there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he manages all the residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property in the city. And there you have it. Only four minutes over. That yeah. wasn't too bad. Thank you, man. always give me lots of information for uh, my state of the city and there's only so much that you could include and I know the city councils appreciate that because one year I think I went and took up their whole meeting. Um, so, but there are some people here that I haven't had a chance to recognize that I just wanted to take a minute because they are so valuable to the team. One of those people in particular is Molly Edinburgh, who is our uh, energy and sustainability <laughs> been doing an amazing job upgrading all of our technology. And behind him is Cynthia Dodd, who does a fabulous job running our libraries. And I don't know what I do without my executive aide and cultural district uh, coordinator, Lois Honegger. And fire chief, Chief Chris LeCaire. who is our um, building inspector and has been, boy, has he been busy over the last couple <laughs> weeks on that. Uh, those of you who don't know, we had another incident with the roof uh, collapsing on um, old Mr. India, and so that ramp from 95, uh, Route 1, I'm sorry, over the Gillis Bridge is closed for the time being because of the um, it's of danger to all residents, just so that you know that. Cool. All right, so which city employees? I saw Dan Lynn out there. I introduced Julie. Who else is out there that I haven't introduced? Paul Hogg, come tuck your head in, Paul. Is Tom Howard out there? Yes. And Tom, could you poke your head in too? Yes. Our HR director, Tracy Maynard. Yeah. Yes, and Peter Lombardi's floating out there somewhere, but he's my uh, director of policy administration, Ryan our person, and I don't know what I'd do without him. And I'm so glad that he is part of our team. So thank you all, I appreciate your time. Have a good meeting, and figure out what to do with fluoride. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, Dr. Bellick here, please? Is Sue Bellick out there? I'd like to see our department head working hard. No? All right then, we'll save that for another time. Um, we have a hard save people here. Yes, uh, Pam. Pam Palumbo. Well, there's uh, our, our nurse, see? You didn't get introduced. Our public health nurse is so critical. Come on, up here. Marshall, Chief, we need you up here too. You have more? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And Dr. Blair from our uh, Board of Health, the Chair. You waiting for your Blair? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to have you from the award today. Thank you very much. Um, Your Honor, Chiefs, ladies and gentlemen of the Council, and residents, uh, I'm Mike Cass. I'm the Director of the State Office of Emergency Medical Services, and I really appreciate the invitation to be here. And I appreciate the reason that I'm here, um, because any time that I can make an appearance and applaud a community for helping to strengthen their EMS system, which ultimately is going to save lives, that makes me very happy. Um, and under the leadership of Pam Palumbo, um, and you know, with, with the assistance of uh, Marshall Howard and Chief LeClaire and the doctor and Atlantic Ambulance um, and all the other various city departments that got involved. Newberry Fort tonight is being recognized as what's known as a heart safe community. And this really is a big deal. What it means is that all the folks that are standing up here worked very hard to make sure that the city met certain qualifications. So you have public CPR classes, you have automatic um, defibrillators and the police cruisers and the frontline fire apparatus. Um, they work closely with your transporting ambulance service and that these defibrillators are accessible um, and the CPR training is accessible. And there's approximately 450,000 out of hospital cardiac arrest deaths a year. And of those 450,000, this is nationwide, of those 450,000, the survival rate is around 10%. In communities that have a um, organized ADD program as recognized through HeartSafe, like Newburyport now has, the survival rate goes up to 40%. So it really is a big deal. Um, and I will read the certificate that I'll present to the mayor. The certificate states, the town of Newburyport, in recognition of the community, it should be city, I'm sorry. <laughs> we can get that fixed, Your Honor. <laughs> in recognition of the community efforts to improve survival from sudden cardiac arrest and for meeting the criteria to be designated a heart safe community. Attained the third day of December 2014, Massachusetts Department of Public Health Office of Emergency Medical Services. So Okay, we're going to be in the regular meeting. Uh, the clerk is going to get the uh, public comment sheet. Uh, before we get started on that, I want to uh, remind people that we have a lot of folks who I believe have signed up to speak. Uh, I can't imagine why. Uh, because of the long um, list of potential speakers, I'm going to hold people to a very strict two-minute time period. Okay. Uh, if you can't Thank say you. something Thank in two minutes, um, then it probably doesn't need to be said two minutes. Like the, um, the projector is so uh, much better. <laughs> Gary's giving me a hard time. You're showing too much. Don't take that off. So let's get that last. Uh, 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 
Do I know how to? I'm going to call people to speak up. in the oh, order in which they down. have signed up to speak. If the comments that you intend to make have already been made by someone else, I would encourage you to um, cede your time to the previous speaker and say, I agree with what that individual has said. Um, or simply to say, my comments have already been made for me. And that way we can get the meeting underway because we have 41 speakers and... Um, 41, goodness. So the first person on our list is Lars Lundgren of uh, Newburyport wanting to speak on fluoridation. Let me point out to speakers that the issue before us regarding fluoridation is whether or not to put it on the ballot. It is not to debate the merits of fluoridation as a, uh, a preventative to, uh, to dental tooth decay. So. <laughs> Please limit your comments to the matter that is before the council. Uh, Mr. Lundgren. My name is Lars Lundgren. I'm a practicing pediatrician in Newburyport for 22 years. I'm a partner at Children's Health Care. I'm also a Newburyport school physician and the assistant medical director at Massachusetts Hospital School. My job in this community is to keep children healthy. The best way I can do that is through preventive care. And in my views, fluoride in our water is the safe and the most effective prevention against tooth decay. I stand here today as a spokesperson for the providers and the American Academy of Pediatrics who cares for children in Newburyport and opposes fiercely the proposed referendum to take the fluoride out of the town water. Um, you have already received all the facts and I hope you've had time to study them. It is difficult to listen to testimony of a few vocal opponents about why fluoride is not good for you, knowing that if they just went to credible sources, they would find out that um, it's good for you, um, and that it only has a positive public health benefit. At optimal concentrations, it's not a neurotoxin, it doesn't cause cancer, heart disease, arthritis, autism, or any of the others that's mentioned. Why are we taking the important time from your busy schedule to have this discussion? I can think of many other public health issues and risk to our children and our community that ought to be, be talking about instead. Cars, for example, are extremely dangerous from fumes and poisons they emit and also risk for accidents. Maybe we should stand here to discuss referendum about banning cars in Newburyport. I don't think that would be a popular uh, issue, however. Uh, how about crisis of, of heroin overdoses in our high schools or cyberbullying and suicides and gun violence and obesity amongst our children? These are real measurable crises, yet we are discussing a public health victory. The sad part is that fluoride debate is built on fear and misinformation. It's often called a poison. It's not a poison in the right concentration in our water. But if the opponent wants to debate that, how about chlorine in our water? I have not seen anywhere the call to take out chlorine and, or that we need to have a consent for it. It does remind me about the anti-vaccine movement who has been misinforming people, even well-known politicians, to not to vaccinate children. We need to understand it's a, that systemic fluoride saves children's teeth and improve their overall health. For many of our children in our community, the parents in the lower socioeconomic class can't afford dental care and therefore this becomes even more important for good oral health. Disabled children that I work with often have difficulty getting the teeth adequately clean. Many teenagers have not touched the toothbrush for weeks. So what would happen for those who can't afford dental care and end up with large economic consequences and chronic health issues? for the children if we took out fluoride in the water. Doctor, your two minutes is up. Would you wrap it up, please? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and and I, I truly apologize to anyone who I have to cut off, but we do have a long list of speakers and I think you've made your point. Again, I ask speakers to stick to the matter that is before the council, whether or not to put it on the ballot. That's the question. I've had a request for uh, one person to be moved to the head of the, uh, of the order, and I hope you'll indulge me in, in allowing Ann Orman to speak now. I took a picture. I feel like I can jump ahead. No, sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank the council for your warm condolences to me on the loss of my mother recently. I appreciate <coughs> that. And, uh, it, uh, it meant a lot to me, so I thank you for that. Number two, I'm here because um, it's that time again when we start thinking about 
the snow going away and the sun coming out and the flowers and <laughs> people coming to Newburyport to shop, dine, uh, look for a place to live, perhaps move here. Um, and so we have put in our annual use of the streets letter and so I would ask you for your consideration of that. And also just a reminder that we're trying to keep promoting shopping and dining and getting services local during this very difficult time. So uh, please try to do as much as you can and I know I've seen a lot of you out there so I appreciate it. But really to everyone even listening tonight, um, get out there and shop, dine, eat, get your services, go to the doctor, go to the hospital, local, because everyone is suffering. It doesn't just mean retail and restaurants. So I heart new report and go to our Facebook page and like it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was a minute and four seconds. Very good. Next is John March. Dr. March. I've been asked by Dr. March to speak on his behalf. Well, you don't look like him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to speak on my own behalf. Can I combine them? Yes, you may. Thank you. Um, John Marsh is the Director of Holistic Family Health in Newbury and is a strong proponent of the use of fluoride in the water. His concern, first and foremost, is that there's a protocol for making public health decisions in, in Newburyport. And he's concerned that the board has already given an opinion about this matter and feels strongly that if public health, <coughs> public, the public opinion differs with that opinion, the appropriate protocol is not to push the matter to a public referendum, but rather if they differ with policies of the present Board of Health members and elect new members. Matters of public health policy should not and cannot be placed on a public referendum ballot as this politicizes a process that should be essentially apolitical. Will we do this with other policies related to health, water testing, childhood immunizations, et cetera? I think not. He also goes in and echoes Dr. Lundgren's comments about uh, fluorosis which is a, not a common condition and occurs, he says, as a result of overuse of toothpaste in young children who swallow the paste rather than spitting it out and is a relatively rare practice, uh, re relatively rare problem. He talked about the rise of dental disease, et cetera, and he talks about the benefits of fluoride and, and his wish uh, that this is a very important uh, modern uh, uh, benefit to all of us and wants this to be <coughs> upheld. I'm speaking as a citizen, as a mother, and um, a child psychologist. I had to go through the rigors of doing research for a, a dissertation, and it was very unpleasant. And the focus was on getting data. So my concern now as a, as a person who lives in the community is, why is this being discussed in a public forum? It makes no sense to me for this to be discussed in a public forum. If this is a matter of concern and uh, question to our public, then we should raise these issues to the experts who are appointed to make these decisions and discuss them intelligently as scientists. But this should not be a public vote. I am a child of the 60s and 70s. I had the benefit of fluoride in my water, in my dental appointments, in my vitamins, in my toothpaste, and I stand here with three cavities at age 53. My brother has zero at age 52. My parents <coughs> had very major dental work done. They were children of post-depression era, and my grandparents came from Poland and had no teeth when they were in their 60s. I certainly want to upheld uh, a very obvious benefit for myself, for my child, for my grandchildren, and not go backwards um, as, as a means to preserve public opinion uh, where I think it doesn't belong. Thank you for your time. And for the record, uh, for the record your name was? Madam Mason. Thank you, Madam. Uh, next is uh, Beverly Hines Lacey, please. I'm Beverly Hines Lacey. I live on Horton Street in Newburyport. And you might know me as a school nurse at the Bresnahan, but I'm standing here as a public health professional, um, not as a school nurse, although I do very much care about my students and, and their health and support um, continuing with fluoridation. Um, I hold a master's degree in epidemiology, master in public health in epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, I've conducted clinical research, worked as an epidemiologist, and now as a public health nurse. So I have an in-depth understanding of the important contributions of public health policies that have made to the lives of every person in this country. Public health focuses on populations of people, not on individuals per se. And so public health by nature is not a democratic process. Um, we have all sorts of policies and law, uh, laws to protect public health. For example, I have to get a safety inspection in my car. I can't drink and drive. I can't smoke in public places. I don't smoke anyway, but um, I have um, to vaccinate my dog against rabies. 
and I have to pay taxes for road improvements. And all of these measures put aside my individual rights to do what I want um, in the interest of public, um, public's health, um, and it is based on the rich history of science, scientific research, and public health epidemiology. So each decision we've made to improve the public's health comes at a small cost to individual rights. Um, and for, I, I, you know, I think of a visual with uh, the Star Trek movie, um, Wrath of Khan, where Spock, he's given up his life for the ship, and he says, the needs, needs of the many outweigh, and Kirk says, the needs of the few. Um, and he says, and the one. And so when I think of that scene, I think about public health, because that's really what we're talking about. We sacrifice our right, um, some rights, to, for the benefit of the, um, of the many. And we don't do this lightly. We base it on solid science. And turning these issues over to a public vote does us all a disservice, in my opinion. Um, there are always those that distrust the system, and then we end up with situations like we currently have with the, with the measles outbreak in this country. So as one of the 10 great, uh, greatest public health achievements in the 20th century, fluoride has been shown over and over again to be beneficial and not harmful to the public's health. We made this decision um, a long time ago in this community um, for the good of the many, and I say it should not be put to a, another public vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next will be James Lacey. While he's approaching, uh, I might point out that if you have written comments and you wish to forego the oral comments, you can submit written comments to the clerk and he'll distribute them to the members. Mr. Lacey. Right, thank you. Uh, I'm James Lacey. I have a PhD in economics. I work in higher education. And uh, my remarks today come from that perspective. And uh, essentially, I would uh, urge that there is no change in the current policy about fluoridation. Uh, the first, part I, first point I want to make is about public goods. Um, governments make expenditures and set policies to benefit the public as a whole for all of us. Those are public goods in economics. Uh, public health is an excellent example of a public good. Um, thinking about our 250th anniversary, if um, we compare the uh, health of that time to today, um, half of us would not be alive. Right? And a lot of that has to do with public health. How public health is, has helped pro prolong life. Uh, the second point I want to make from an economic point of view has to do with opportunity cost or, or making trade-offs. Um, although fluoride is one of the safest and most cost-effective ways to control cavities, it does not allow opting out. Um, any more than one can opt out from fire protection or anti-smoking rules or zoning. Right? So opting out is not, is not an option. So the trade-off that we're facing from an economic point of view is the discomfort of, that some people have with fluoride on one hand, and on the other hand, increasing the cavity rate among the children of Newburyport maybe as much as 50%. So that's the trade-off that we are facing. Um, and if we do the math and we compare communities that have fluoride and don't have fluoride, we see a significant difference between those two uh, kinds of communities. 30 uh, seconds. Right, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Uh, Barry Spiro of Lafayette Street. And now my microphone. Hello, I am Barry Spiro. I am a dentist for 40 years. I am pro-fluoride. Ballot on or ballot off. I'm scared. I'm scared for the children of the 18,000 people in Newburyport. Let's call it 1,000 children. If it's on the ballot, they don't get to vote for that 1,000 votes. I'm scared for the disabled people. Let's call them another thousand. I'm scared for the indigent people that won't be able to make a decision, yes or not. And I'm scared for the immigrants that don't even speak the language. So I don't think it should be on the ballot. Um, the 
the CDC is the most revered institute in the world. They have said it's in the water for the country. It's been there for 70 years. Uh, over 200 million Americans in this state, 70 percent have fluoridated water. It should not go on the ballot. It should continue at status quo as it is right now. We live in the greatest country in the world. We're in the greatest state in that greatest country. And we're the greatest city in that state. <laughs> 18,000, we don't have any of the crime, but we have all of the history and the, all of the beauty. We have L William Lloyd Garrison, who stood against the other tide at, at 200 years ago. We should not have fluoride on a ballot. We, sh we are moving forward in our medical world in the last 100 years. We should continue to move forward. We should not move backward. We should not have fluoride on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> you know, we'll move a lot faster if there's no applause. And I, I appreciate the fact that you encourage one another, but I, I think that uh, we would get farther along uh, tonight if we refrain from applauding one another's efforts. Uh, next. I believe it's. Um, 185 Arch Street, but the name I can't read. It begins with a B, first name, second name starts with a C. Cannon, I believe, is the last name, or Canaan. Does that ring a bell, anyone? All right, I'm going to skip that one and go to Karen Heisdor, I believe it is. Is that, is that correct, Karen? That is correct. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Heisdor. Um, unfortunately, I believe that the fluoride should go on the ballot um, only because it's the only way to get people to vote for it. Um, I'll start out by saying that we could argue science all night and still not know the true answers by the end of it. Uh, there are studies on both sides. And most of the time, the outcome of the study depends on who paid for the study. Uh, the World Health Organization has found that countries that do not use fluoride have the same decline in tooth decay as countries that use fluoride. So the United States is one of only eight countries in the world that fluoridates greater than 50% of the population. Countries that stop fluoridation, like Finland and Denmark, continued to have a decline in tooth decay after they stopped the fluoride. Some of them had an even greater decline than when they had fluoride. Um, this is the World Health Organization. The National Research Council found that um, fluoride does not decrease tooth decay. It doesn't. There's like 0.6% of one surface of one tooth difference between fluoridated and unfluoridated areas. This is all recent, this is 2006. We're not talking about studies from the 1950s. Now the only three uses I know of for fluoride before it was put in the water was as a rat poison, as an insecticide, and it was used in the United Kingdom up until the 1950s to treat overactive thyroid, hyperthyroidism. It lowered thyroid function right now in the United States as of a few years ago, synthetic thyroid hormone was the third largest, most prescribed drug in the United States. Thank you. Your time is up. No applause, please. Mike Foley? I'm sorry. I'm just you to are from uh, East Broadway, Rockport. Do I have to? Mike Broadway, Rockport. Okay, Mr. Teisner from uh, 376 Essex Street, Gloucester. Go ahead, Mr. Foley. Yes, I'm Mike Foley from Gloucester. The story of fluoridation is now seven decades old, as are the arguments for and against the value and wisdom of ingesting fluoride. There are believers and non-believers. But most folks are agnostics when it comes to the religion of drinking fluoridation. And as with most major religions, fluoridation has its dogmas, mantras, followers, crusaders, 
holy men and martyrs. It also has people who have gained wealth and others who have suffered in pain along the way. In this day and age, we pride ourselves on technology and a growing understanding of the universe, yet each of us holds on tight to our comfortable beliefs. There are old fluoridation studies of very poor quality and positive bias, which have been long discredited. There are recent moderate quality studies which warn us against fluoridation, yet for the masses, the distinction is moot. A clear understanding remains elusive, and re we, we resort to our beliefs. Religions can be imposed on other people. Human history, as we are well aware, is littered with the skeletons of non-believers. Our founding fathers sought, sought to stop the insanity by prohibiting government by imposing religion on people. Yet the religion of Floridation somehow fell through a hole in the law. There are heretics who live in Floridated communities. Among them are those acutely sensitive to fluoride, inf infants, the elderly, people of color, and those with thyroid and kidney issues, to name a few. Also among the purveyors of heresy are those who have taken the time to read and understand the independent evidence of recent years. Thank you, Mr. Foley. Your time is up. Thank you. Um, a name that I can't read, uh, I believe it's 12 Wharf Street, Rockport. Would you please identify yourself? What is your name again? I'm sorry. Joanne Souza. That's correct. I, I guess that's correct. Thank you, jo Joanne. As a resident of Rockport, I feel that the fluoridation issue is one of the most critical conversations our town has had in decades. This May, our town residents will be, will be given a choice as to whether or not to continue fluoridation. In neighboring Gloucester, residents will be giving a choice also next fall when it's on the ballot. In a city with so many young families, the choice to remove fluoride is even more critical here in Newburyport. If you prefer not to educate yourself as to the dangers of fluoride, all you need to do is read the warnings on any tube of toothpaste that contains fluoride. You should know that the fluoridation of public water contradicts the Safe Water Drinking Act. I quote, no national primary drinking water regulation may require the addition of any substance for preventative health care purposes unrelated to the contamination of drinking water. Water used for drinking should contain nothing else except in cases where it may be necessary to remove any doubt of possible contamination. You owe it to your city to at least give your residents a choice as to whether or not to continue fluoridation of your water. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on my list is, it uh, looks like Ed, I'm going to say our back, but I'm not sure I've got that right, on Norman Avenue. 8 Norman Avenue. Ed, last name, I believe is our back. Okay, uh, then Chris Martin on Beck Street. Well, this issue of fluoridation, it's confusing, it's multi-layered, <coughs> and it's emotionally charged. I doubt there's anyone in this room who at some point in their life didn't hear that fluoride was good for their teeth and were glad that it was in the water. But I have to say that was then and this is now. Now we have serious concerns. Even if one was to just look at the daily news in the last two weeks and walk and listen to the letters to the editor about fluoride and look at the responses, you'd have to come out saying there are studies that say it works and there are studies that are saying it doesn't. Well, even if it's 50-50, why would we want to take the chance to have it in our water? You know, this can't be denied that this is serious concerns now about the effects of fluoride. It's a lot to absorb, and by the way, it isn't pleasant. We, none of us, want to be involved in something that has been harmful, and yet, everything that has ever changed has changed under struggle. And when there's something we don't like, we resist it. But that's how changes happen. We shift and we learn. We learned that lead is very dangerous. We learned it's a neurotoxin. We got it out of our walls, our ceilings, our floors, but most importantly, out of our water. It's against the Clean Water Act. 
Now we're learning about fluoride is a neurotoxin. And it's questionable whether it should be in our water. So please, let the people of Newburyport choose. Let us be like Gloucester and Rockport and have a choice. And Concord, Mass, too. Let us be like Amesbury and Methuen who have had a chance. And by the way, 95% of European countries have made this choice. We need this choice here. Thank you. Thank you. No applause, please. Next is uh, Linda Bog uh, Bogdanoff of Lime Street. I apologize in advance if I mispronounce any, probably many of your names. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Linda Bogdanoff. I live in Newburyport, and my background is in medical diagnostic imaging. And the only reason I mention that is that I've worked in this field for 30 years. And over that time period, as new data has come forward, many practices and policies in all areas of medicine have changed. Um, I think that's what we're looking at today. And I think if we, you know, if we look back, many things that we thought were innocuous, over time we found are not necessarily good for us. We know that the x-rays were overused in the 50s and we've gradually cut down on that over time. Radium was used to, to, in watches and clocks, DES to promote growth in cattle, cigarettes, the list goes on and on, mercury and amalgam fillings. Things as simple as vitamin C and calcium, which in small doses are great for us, but in large doses, heart problems, kidney problems, there's all kinds of problems associated with it. So I think we really have to be open to the fact that there is data out there that supports that fluoride has its issues. And more importantly, we're seeing a lot of new information today. There's a lot out there. And what we know is that it's a neurotoxin. We know that its effects are cumulative. Again, I want to remind you that the question is whether or not to put it on the ballot, not to debate I the merits of fluoridation. Should. Okay, I do believe we should put it on the ballot. I think that Newburyport the reason I moved here is it's a progressive, open-minded community. I think it's only fair to the people of this community to educate ourselves on both sides of the issue and to take an open mind and not have, you know, not a blind eye to the fact that perhaps what we've done for years and years is not the right thing to do. So, thank you for thank your comments. You. Next, uh, it looks like Preston, I want to say Curtis. Uh, I have a zip code, 01930. And I don't know if this FL stands for Florida or fluoride, but you can tell us when you get to the microphone. Right. Sorry. You okay? <laughs> Sorry. Um, my name is Preston Curtis. I live in Gloucester. I was asked by someone here last <coughs> about coming to this <coughs> meeting that we have to talk about fluoride. <coughs> I was really Excuse a disbeliever. But my human nature is that I challenge every single thing that comes along because you have to think for yourself whether you eat or whether you do anything, is it safe or is it not safe? The long and short of it is, I think that we, this should be on the ballot for anybody, anywhere, in any town, any state. Why? Because we don't know what's in the water. We do not know. So I'd rather play it safe and have everybody given the chance in, through education and progressive attitudes of people understand what's going on. <clears throat> it's really important for people to think about this and I'm not in the health industry. I have not been swayed by anybody in the health industry. So therefore, I think as a common human person, I can look at this more objectively than anyone in the health industry. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Susan Sloan on the Park Circle. Hi. I just want to add to uh, Karen's listing of the countries. I also want to say that Scotland uh, has ceased fluoridating their water supply and recently uh, Israel and Ireland also voted to stop fluoridating their water across the entire country. So the last time I spoke before you I brought to your attention the fact that fluoride products like toothpaste and that which is used in our water supply are labeled as poison not to be ingested by the manufacturers themselves. These warning labels absolve them from responsibility and liability of injury or harm to those who swallow it. 
There are no credentials, degrees, or scientific studies that will convince me that swallowing or bathing in poison is beneficial in any way to anyone. But I'm not here to convince you of anything one way or another mm -hmm. about fluoride, because regardless of my opinion, your opinion, or anyone's opinion, whether fluoride is beneficial or not, it is labeled as a poisonous drug by those who make and sell it. I implore you to allow the voters of Newburyport to choose whether or not to consume it. I and all of the people who have spoken to you about this subject are only asking one thing of you, and that is to put this on the ballot in November so that Newburyport citizens can exercise their freedom of choice and decide for themselves what is best for them. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Elizabeth, and I can't pronounce your last name, uh, on Marquand Lane. Yes. What is your last name? Too well. I'm sorry. I was, I was going to take a stab at that. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Goulot. I'm a resident of Newburyport. Um, my husband and I are raising our children here. We drink the tap water. Um, I'm 100% in favor of keeping it fluoride, fluoridated. I'm a registered nurse. I work at, um, I've worked at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston for years, both in research as well as on the floors. Um, I found it interesting that we gave an award tonight for uh, cardiac health in this um, city based on what we do in healthcare, which is evidence-based studies, that um, having the AD devices improves results in communities. Um, that's how we do things in healthcare. We look at the evidence, and we follow the evidence. That's how we do things at Beth Israel. That's how we do things um, in the schools, where I also have now started working as a substitute. Um, I'm familiar with scientific re uh, literature. I'm familiar with reading it. I'm familiar with looking at literature reviews. It's not easy to sort of determine, as we've heard here, what is a, a good, well-researched, peer-reviewed study and what is not. These are not the kinds of things that we need to be asking um, our community to do. We all have our different uh, jobs that we do in the world. We all have our different levels of expertise. And to ask people who have no expertise in fluoride to make decisions for all of our children about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing is, is not a good idea. Um, the, the recent fear uh, that we see on fluoridation, we're seeing it across the country in all kinds of scientific issues. The vaccination debates, the evolution is even being questioned. Um, but when we look to these things, we need to look at the science. We need to look at the Board of Health and what they recommend. We need to look to the CDC and what they recommend. We need to look to the American uh, Dental Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association. All of the world's health organizations your, support the fluoridation of water. Thank you for Thank your comments. You. Sam Arabi, uh, four brown, uh, seven brown square. <laughs> So I work and live here um, as a dentist, but I'm also a public health professional, and I work in Malawi, Africa, with Safe Water International, the organization. And we, uh, in the villages I work in, the well, the well water has one point, part, one, point, one, point, one part per million fluoridation in the water naturally. And we all may be living here, and there's one part per million fluoridation in well water in America, in a lot of communities, but we all eventually originally came from Africa, as white as this community is, we all have ancestry in Africa, and it's part of our history as human beings to have this health benefit naturally in the water. It's in all the water. It's in all the bottled water. It's just not labeled because they didn't add it. It's not an additive. It's part of water. Just like we don't breathe pure oxygen, we have components in our oxygen. Uh, in the oceans, we have one part per million. When we evolved out of the oceans, we evolved out of one part per million water, fluoridated water. That's natural. That sounds pretty natural. So it's our right. It's our right. It benefits even our pets. And as we've seen, uh, it's about 60 plus years of research we have, active research, active. We question it. At Harvard, we've questioned it. We researched against 
osteonecrosis, osteosarcoma against cancers. We can't find anything. If I found anything, it would make my career, but I haven't found anything, right? So th this is not something that the general public can understand. We can't subject people. Googling is ni neither research nor education. It's neither research nor education to Google data. It is, doesn't even use library science to find the information. It's wrong to put 60 plus years. We may have voted it in, but that was 60 years ago, 70 years ago, not 60 plus years of research that you're asking people to go through. And we've already heard some bad science. I mean, how much more can there be out there? It's not good for people to be Googling all this fear. And basically, I just feel that the community is above that, and it's uh, beneath the dignity of the community to let that happen. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dave Rech uh, Rechik, uh, One In Street. Hi, I'm Dr. Dave Rezik. I'm a dentist here in New York. <coughs> and um, you know, some of the things that I've heard tonight from a group of people that don't come from the report that are supporting it to be on the ballot are part of the reason why I have really concerns about it going on the ballot. It's because they're, they're saying things, and, and some of the stuff I've read in the newspaper is classic. Uh, some of these legislative editors from uh, a dentist from Texas and uh, somebody from Indiana. They don't come from New Report. They, they don't have our values. They don't, and, they, and they're throwing stuff at us that is scary. And people are going to read these things and they're going to not know the truth. And this is just what Dr. Moravi said, is that to go in and do a real scientific-based research on the, on, the, on, the, on the true data of whether fluoride is good or not good is very, very hard for a person. You know, they have four kids, they're working. They, I mean, who's got a time to spend eight hours and just go down and really do research on this kind of stuff? So what do they do? They read a newspaper and, and some of the misinformation, the lies that are going out there are ridiculous. They're really bizarre. They really are. But they're going to influence people to do the wrong thing. And my big fear is that the kids that, we're that right now that are very young or about to be born, we're not going to know the harm we did to them if we, if we reverse this until it's too late. And those kids are going to have to live with our consequences if we don't do the right thing here. It's really important. <clears throat> I want to, you know, the people that are supporting this, did at any time, um, you know, the council that's supporting this, did at any time did you get together a group of, of, of medical experts, dentists, pediatricians, physicians, nurses, health educators, and get a group together and say, hey, listen, there's some people that are concerned about this issue. How about if we get a group and you guys can tell me why you think it's such a good thing? Did anybody educate themselves or did we go on the internet and read about bizarre stories that have no fact and no truth? But that's what we do and that's what we do as a public and that's what a lot of people will do. The reality is, is fluoride is a very, very important health benefit to the children in the report and it would be a major mistake if we put this on the ballot and let people be influenced by lies. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Joyce Adams. Of, uh, looks like uh, 9 Hanscom Street. Harrison. Harrison, thank you. Hi. I've been living in Newburyport for 30 years, and um, I like to think that I don't look my age, but I was born in 1951, which was just before they came up with fluoride. It was a great year. It was a great year. <laughs> <laughs> and if we had a camera that could go on my mouth, you'd see the benefits of fluoride. That's all I have to say. I really don't care whether we put it to a referendum or not because I think the people in the report are wise enough to vote for fluoride in the water. Thank you. Sarah, looks like Greenlaw. Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Greenlaw. I'm a general dentist. I live in Cambridge, but I was asked to come by some residents of the community since I work in a public health clinic in the North Shore. So many of my residents are from this area, Newburyport in particular. Um, I just wanted to speak especially, like many of my colleagues and other people who, um, residents of the town who came up to say that I believe this is, should not be put to a ballot vote by the residents. Uh, this is a public health measure, like many people have talked about, and the biggest thing that I can stress is that there's already fluoride in the water. I know this isn't about the science behind it, but there very well could be more fluoride than is efficient for, for preventing caries, dental cavities. So if you don't have water fluoridation, there's no way to monitor it, and it could actually, having more fluoride, it actually um, is more aesthetic thing, really. It's just added to the, to the teeth. But it's not that we're adding it. That's why it's not a problem. Um, and also the biggest thing, I think, too, is that the children, are the, the people who are going to benefit the most from it, and they don't have a vote. 
Um, so I think it's important to leave it off the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. I have Dr. Lundgren's name here, but I believe he's already spoken, unless there's a different Dr. Lundgren. Is that correct? I already spoke. Thank you. Uh, Mike Riccio. I submitted my opinions earlier today by email, so I won't uh, review the whole things all over again, other than to say I, uh, Dr. Marabi, Dr. Rizik, and, and the uh, uh, dentist just prior to me did a beautiful job and echoed totally my sentiments on the issue. Thank you. Thank you for your brevity. Uh, Kathy Riccio. Hello, I'm Kathy Riccio. I am a school nurse here in Newburyport, and I support keeping fluoridation. I've been in school health for eight years. I'm concerned about losing fluoridation for children. I've seen, I visited Springfield, Massachusetts, and I've been involved in their oral health screenings of children. Springfield does not have fluoridated water. I know the increase of caries in that student population. I'm concerned for the future of the children and the amount of lost time going to the dentist, worried about opening it up. And the last part I want to say is, again, opening it up. I do have a master's in public health. Ten cents will get you a cup of coffee. But um, <laughs> what we are trying to do for the public good is we take things very, very seriously. Studies are studied with evidence-based peer review. One study does not prove anything. It must be replicated. And that is what has happened over the 65 years of over 3,000 published articles and research papers on fluoride and fluoridation so that it has, if there are these concerns, we would have found them, that we, we, we would know about them. It is an extremely safe and efficient and it's wonderful for the city of Newburyport. Please keep fluoride for the children. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dave Retschek. Already, Already spoke. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Tracy Ritchie, uh, 17 River Street, Gloucester. Thank you. Um, my name is Tracy Ritchie, and I'm with the KPM Fluoride Action Network in Gloucester. And as you know, Gloucester is considering fluoridation of our public water supply as well. You may also be aware that the Gloucester City Council has voted to put fluoride question on the ballot. And we will be voting on that in November. The citizens of Newburyport deserve the right to decide for themselves whether or not they want to be fluoridated. But more importantly, citizens of any community should not be forced to take a medication against their will. Water is being fluoridated to treat the disease of tooth decay, therefore it is being used as a medicine. And as a medicine, each and every one of us has a right to choose what medical treatment we receive. Water fluoridation denies us of our <coughs> fundamental freedom of choice. The fact that fluoride is a poison is enough for me not to want to ingest it. <coughs> You don't need to be a medical professional to know that adding a non-approved <coughs> FDA drug, which is classified as a poison, should not be added to our water supply. All you need is common sense. The fluoride added to our water is not the naturally occurring calcium fluoride that is in the water that you find in a well. It is sodium fluoride. It is a toxic poison. It's not the same. Um, let's see. What justifies <coughs> subjecting anyone to take in this poisonous, unimproved medicine against their will. Don't we deserve the right to inform consent? Don't we, the people, deserve the right to choose our medical treatment? Our freedom of medical choice is being taken away. It is literally impossible not to be exposed to fluoride when you put it in the drinking water. You can't escape it. If you want to use fluoride, it is your right, and it is readily available. But for those of us who wish not to use fluoride, we have no choice. Where is our justice? Fluoride supplements cost about $4 a month. I spend a lot more on bottled water for a month, and I'm still being exposed to fluoride. Every time I bathe. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. 
Tracy Rich that was Tracy Ritchie, Tracy correct? Ritchie. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Fisher, and I ask uh, for your address, please, because you didn't include it on the comments on your when you signed up. It's 82 Main Street, Raleigh. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I'm a dental hygienist. I've been asked by um, a Newburyport um, colleague. Um, I'm a hygienist at the North Shore Public Health Center. Um, I'm here because I provide hygiene services to your public. I am very packed <laughs> with uh, lower socioeconomic people, patients, um, taking fluoride uh, off the, or putting the fluoride on the ballot would not provide the uh, city with, um, or the patients with, that I see to a benefit. It would be a disservice, primarily with the children. Um, there's not much I can do once they get the cavities. One area that um, I have to fight is the food, food industry, uh, and not so much with the basis of fluoride. Fluoride does help, the studies there to help promote good teeth, promote the, you know, the, the enamel, the mineralization. Um, and then uh, if you take it out of the fluoride, the children that already are provided with the sugary substances are not getting a benefit. They're actually having less fluoride, the less mineralization, it's not helping. So keep it up to that, please. Thank you. Uh, Chris Martell of Amesbury, please. Well, thank you again for allowing uh, us to address the council tonight. My name is Chris Martell of Amesbury, Mass. I'm here tonight to urge the council to vote, to allow the residents of Newburyport to vote on the city's practice of community water fluoridation. Please don't use your vote tonight to take away the right for thousands of your residents to vote in November. Please think of everyone in their basic human rights, the right to use water that is free from added industrial waste. It's not about you or me or our own personal opinion. It's about everyone collectively. No one is unequal, and as such, each individual has a right to decide for themselves. You have an opportunity tonight to ensure the right of each resident to decide for themselves what is better for them and their families. This is about choice. This is about informed consent. And this most certainly is about the practice of adding sodium fluoride, a poisonous, toxic industrial waste product, to your public water supply. Most people don't really know what they are ingesting. Allowing the people to vote gives everyone a chance to learn about what they are ingesting, to learn about what is being added to their water supply, to learn about what is going into their bodies and thus affecting their overall health. The people deserve the opportunity to know for themselves and to vote their conscience accordingly. It is unethical and immoral to ask residents to ingest something against their will, especially when there are so many alternatives available for those that want to treat themselves with fluoride, all of which are mainly topical, with toothpaste, mouthwash, dental rinse programs, sealants, and prescription medication. Please use your vote tonight to allow your residents to vote on the practice of community water fluoridation in November. Just a quick definition. An anti-fluoridationist is not a person who believes in poor dental health or that fluoride should be taken out of all products that are purchased voluntarily by the consumer. <coughs> Thank you for your time and for having an open mind. Thank you, Mr. Martel. Next is uh, Vincent uh, Zanfanga of Beck Street. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Lead asbestos uh, tobacco reversals um, have resulted in huge liability claims. The fluoride industry's best chance to avoid such claims is to dismiss, deny, and denigrate opposition. We all know about Amesbury's situation a couple of years ago. <clears throat> Not only did we find the same situation here on dissolved cakes, we found that the crews replacing the water mains in Amesbury found that there were large clumps of chemicals that were formed and attract, attracted to rotted unions, joints, around corners, dead ends, and cul-de-sacs. <clears throat> when these caked residues break off, who knows what level of toxicity you may ingest. Along the way, we found newly released studies proving that <clears throat> the Chinese fluoride that is supplied to us is contaminated with lead, arsenic, antimony, a whole litany of metals, heavy metals, ADA, AMA, CDC, have no liability, <clears throat> and FDA calls it an orphan drug because there is no category for toxic. <clears throat> the, 
EPA is in charge of the Clean Water Act. We found that the immediate liability lies in the places the toxins go in the water. That's the water department. Now we have informed the special counsel in August about new studies that were presented <clears throat> to all of you, and the, the entire council knows about it, <clears throat> that there is now lead and arsenic in the Chinese um, fluoride that comes into our city. The law known as the Clean Water Act requires that lead not be introduced into the drinking water system. And now that you all know it, you actually are all <laughs> responsible in holding the bag. And it is a law that it has to be, actually has to be tested and the results have to be kept for 30 years. <clears throat> and speaking of litigation, it also should be noted that Erin Brockovich has picked up the fluoride lobbies and she's now battling it publicly. We have hopes that the City Council will allow the citizens of New Report Thank um, you. to your, vote your on this controversial inspired. issue. Thank you. Uh, Bill Patnaud, uh, looks like 10 Brentwood Street, West Newbury. No, that, that's, that's McCoy. I'm but sorry. I'm, I'm here, yeah. My son grew up in Newburyport. Good. He was on a track team, he was on cross country team. He was here for about 28 years being poisoned by the fluoride that you guys put in the water. Not, not your fault, but everybody behind me who called us liars, okay? He hasn't read anything about the opposition of fluoride. Dr. Hardy Lineback, a research dentist from the University of Toronto, past president of the Canadian Dental Association. As a dentist, he said he didn't know. This is, this is well documented. As a research dentist, get rid of fluoride in water. Hip fractures and elderly and endocrine system problems, thyroid problems. That's a research dentist, not a dentist. As a dentist, when he was past president of the Canadian, he didn't know either, neither do these guys. The other situation is they can't tell us how much children are, are ingesting a fluoride. Let me interrupt you for a second. The issue is put it on the ballot or not. It should it be on the ballot, and I'll tell you. Well, they, they were right. talking about CDC and stuff. I'm, I'm there are, there are, there are a ahead. bunch of guys on the wall out there who fought for freedom of choice, freedom of speech. Are you going to let them down by saying these guys who were, who were just taught, they were just taught all through their school, oh, yeah, fluoride's good, fluoride's good, fluoride's good. It's, it's not good. It's an accumulative toxin. Used to make the atomic bomb, uranium hexafluoride. It's using, it's using a laser right now. Heavy water and fluoride chemical, they excite the molecule, boom, you got a laser. That's documented. All I want to say is, look, fluoride is not good. It's everywhere. It's in Kellogg's, because Battle Creek, Michigan fluoridated. It's in Minneapolis, Minnesota, all General Mills. It's in pesticides, all residues in your juices in your vegetables, in your fruits. It's everywhere. It's in Gatorade. It's in beer. 66% of the country is fluoridated. They can't tell you how much a kid is ingesting through all, all those things that people would ingest. Thank you for your time. Freedom of choice. Thank you. Dan Ayak of 58 High Street. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dan Eink, I'm board certified in, in internal medicine, board certified in medical acupuncture. And so we've talked about a lot of studies saying it <coughs> says it all backs fluoride. I just want you to know that sometimes Big Brother makes a mistake. If you go and look at the food pyramid the last 50, 60 years, all backed up by credible evidence, it led to another 20 or 30 percent of people having diabetes and obesity. Based on good facts, wrong. I just spent the weekend with the top military doc at uh, Anderson Air Force Base on acupuncture. 50 years ago, acupuncture was not accepted. It is now. Big Brother doesn't always get it right. We need to make this choice because in my practice, I find fluoride to be a problem. <clears throat> the incidence of fluoride is 40% in our kids. That was stated in the news channels in 2009. Of that, 1% is severe. Meaning at Newburyport High School, 3,000 kids there, 1% of 3,030 kids have severe dental fluorosis, probably never been told, and they should be told not to drink any of our water at all. That's a problem. So I think fluoride's a medicine, and it should be controlled by the dentists and the doctors on an individual basis, and that's really where I'm coming from. And so I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Scott Foster from Newburyport. Scott Foster, okay. Amelia McMillan, new report. Hello, 
Amelia McMullen. I'm actually a resident of Newberry, 8 Graham Ave. I receive fluorinated water from Newburyport. I'm here because I would like it on the ballot. I would like Newburyport to be able to choose whether or not we want this in our water. Um, fluoride is a medicine. Um, it's also, it um, intensifies allergic reactions. So I suffer from a handful of different allergies. So really, I cannot consume it because of allergies. That's completely unfair for anybody. Tons of us have allergies. So if we have an allergy, we cannot consume the water that goes into our system. We buy it, and because it's fluorinated, we can't consume it. This needs to be on the ballot. We need to have a choice. So I say yes, put it on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Teichness, uh, I believe it is, Boxford, Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, I should have known that. Yeah. Met you before. Go ahead. A lot of things have been said that I agree with. I am for putting it on the ballot. I come from Boxford. I started an organization about a year and three months ago called Health Roundhouse. And we decided as a group to basically uh, work on one issue. Unfortunately for me, it happened to be fluoride somewhat because I'm in Boxford and I live in a fluoride-free community because I have well water. I also am very fortunate that my kids do not have any cavities and they did not have any exposure to fluoride. It's diet, diet, diet. Nutrition in this country has been a problem for over 100, 150 years. I would make, like to make it clear also that it, USDA policy, this is a USDA book that came out in 1939 and it's very clear what it states about fluoride. It says very clearly, for the reason it is especially important that fluorine be avoided during the period of tooth formation. That is from birth to the age of 12 years. That to me says it right there in a nutshell. After, during World War II, a lot of changes took place, many changes, including our education system, including the fact that in the 1930s, if you look at the amount of dental schools that were built and where the money came from, you get the feeling that the curriculum was changed, and it was changed. And I would like to close with one thing. With many possible effects and few possible benefits, my question to the community of Newburyport is, if your water supply was already fluoride fl free, would you vote to add fluoride to the water now? Perhaps the answer is, answer is when in doubt, leave it out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Teichman. Elaine Carroll. Thank you. I'm a resident of New Report, and I'm opposed to having the issue of fluoride put on the ballot. And the reason is that I've been listening to all these arguments tonight. I'm not a medical person. I wouldn't have a clue how to vote. I feel that the people who spoke in favor of, of the putting it on the ballot actually made a compelling reason for keeping it off, because really, uh, there's so many arguments for and against. I, I believe that we have people who are employed in the city of Newburyport, the health department. They should be looking into this. It is really not up to me <coughs> to make a decision. I, I don't know what I would do. Or are we going to have lots and lots of public education and mailings to the residents of Newburyport so that we can be, make an informed decision? So I am opposed to having it on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. David McFarland of Newburyport. Now I'm again, I want to put it on the ballot. The right to decide on medication is something the medical profession and our country's Bill of Rights has always given us, unless it affects somebody else. You even have the right to smoke, as long as you do it in a way that doesn't feel with anybody else. We're losing a basic right. People talk about taking our rights away to vote for it because they don't think we're smart enough to understand it. I've never heard anybody that's pro fluoridation stand up here and tell me what it is. What's in it? It's Chinese hazardous waste. The fluoride that's in it is not natural. It's synthetic sodium fluoride. Natural fluoride is calcium fluoride. It's got arsenic, uranium, lead, tungsten. It doesn't even tell you how much is in it. 
It just hints it's there. People had to test it themselves to find out what was in it. The Board of Health can't tell you how much lead it's in it. If you ask the professionals that promote this stuff, they'll tell you. They'll use the old adage that it's the dose that makes the poison. 500 years old, it's not the dose. That's the half-truth half that deceives people. The whole truth is the dose, how frequently it's given, how long it's given, what other me medicals it's joined with, in your body and in the water. Would you give your kid, day after day after day, a potpourri of mixture that's got lead in it, got arsenic in it, got uranium in it, and who knows what else? When it comes from China, it's different every month, every batch. You don't know what's in it. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. Scott Mortimer, new report. Scott Mortimer. I'll move on. I believe the last name is Bard, but I'm not sure, sure of that. Roz, is that the first name of Newburyport? Class. Could you repeat the name? Roz Class. I'm sorry. Thank you. Good evening. I'm a resident of Newburyport. Uh, I think there's a rather distressing trend at the minute to roll back public health initiatives that have been put in place and resulted in improved health for everyone in the communities, regardless of their financial situation. Fluoridation in our water system has been proven repeatedly through numerous scientific studies to improve the health of our teeth, cutting down on the incidence of decay and strengthening our teeth. It occurs naturally in our, our water and the systems in place allow us to monitor and make sure the quantities are at an acceptable level and ensure children in particular benefit. Tooth decay is the biggest reason children miss school. Water fluoridation is the easiest way to help combat tooth decay and make this benefit easily available to everyone. It is a public health issue which should not go on the ballot. Thank you. And the last speaker, uh, Dr. Robin Blair. Good evening. I'm chairman of the Board of Health. The Board of Health is comprised of three health care professionals. And we've held hearings on the fluoridation issue. And based on uh, evidence that has been presented to us both for and against the fluoridation of water, uh, the Board of Health is recommending to the City Council that it not be put on the ballot. We support fluoridation in our water. Also, I think this has been put into all of your boxes. It is a petition that has been signed by over 70 healthcare professionals in Newburyport uh, supporting uh, fluoridation, as well as a list of Massachusetts agency, health agencies and organizations that are in favor of maintaining uh, the fluoride in the water, as well as a list of national health organizations and international, including the World Health Organization, which support keeping fluoride in the water. That is the position of the Newburyport Board of Health. Thank you, Dr. Blair. Uh, that concludes our public comment period. We'll take a five-minute recess.
this evening of the approval of the minutes for February 12, 2015. There are no transfers. There are two communications. A letter from the Yankee Homecoming General uh, Chair to the city. Um, that is to be referred to public safety. The second letter is from uh, Ann Orman, Chamber of Commerce, and that is for the use of streets in 2015. Uh, I should mention that there is a change in that letter for the Riverfront Festival, which will now be held on September 5th. I believe it was August 26th. Uh, there are, uh, there's a first reading of one reappointment. <coughs> Suzanne Marzi Cameron, 17 Oakland Street to the Affordable Housing Trust until January 1st, 2017. And with that small change, that is the consent agenda this evening. Thank you. Uh, what is the will of the council? Could that item be removed? So moved. The, uh, that item being the appointment, correct? The appointment of Suzanne Cameron. Uh, motion to approve is amended. Second. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Move on to the regular agenda. We have the appointments first. I'm sorry, we have a communication for four appointments. In communication number three, which was a late file. The gist of which is that uh, Deborah Aldrich, uh, New Report Chocolate Tour Chair, would like it to be held Saturday, May 16th from 1 to 5 p.m. Motion. I have a motion. Motion to approve. Second. A motion moved and seconded. A motion to approve. Any discussion? Councilor. Um, thank you, uh, Councilor. I spoke to Mrs. Aldrich today. This was kind of sitting in limbo. Um, this is something that's been going on for, I think, the past 10 years. Nothing has changed, and she's just eager to get it approved so she can start with the advertising. So I would appreciate if this could just um, approve tonight. Any other comments from the members? Uh, hearing none, we'll uh, take this on a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The motion passes. The next item up for discussion tonight are the uh, appointments and second reading. We'll need a roll call for these. There are two uh, reappointments, Barry J. McBride, 5 Pine Street, Salisbury, to the assistant wiring position until January 31st, 2016, and Paul M. Bevilacqua, 126 Merrimack Street, Unit 3, to the Tree Commission until November 1st, 2018. Motion to approve collectively. Second. The motion is to approve these items collectively, and there's a second. Is there any discussion? Uh, hearing none, we'll ask for a roll call. Councilor Harquist. Yes. Councilor Hirsog. Yes. Councilor Kinsey. Yes. Councilor Tantar. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Connell. Yes. Councilor Cronin. Yes. Councilor Eigenman. Yes. Councilor Junta. Yes. And Councilor Bryan is absent. And that applies to both reappointments. Collectively is what I Collectively. Thank you. Let's move on to orders. <coughs> we have a table order. <coughs> Don't we have an appointment? Well, we, we, we have, have an order. appointment. Point of order. Appointment. We have a, an appointment. Uh, communication uh, again. Um, sorry, an appointment first reading. Susan Marzi Cameron, 17 I Oakland apologize, Street. you're correct. It's Susan Good. and I'm going to recuse myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not for him to walk out. I, maybe I should recuse myself. <laughs> Excuse myself, Suzanne Marzi Cameron, 17 Oakland Street, Football Housing Trust until January 1st, 2017. What's the will of the council? Motion to approve. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Is that approved in one reading? Can, uh, if I may, I'd like to restate the motion as a motion to approve in one reading. Uh, that's acceptable to the chair. Is the second willing to accept that motion? Sure. Certainly. So that it is uh, an appropriate measure for us to consider. Is there any discussion of that motion? <coughs> uh, hearing none, we'll take a roll call on this matter. Council Harquist. Yes. Council Hersog. Yes. Council Kinsey. Yes. Council Tontar. Yes. Council Vogel. Yes. Council Cameron is recused himself. Council Connell. Yes. Council Cronin. Yes. Council Eigenman. Yes. Council Junta. Yes. Council President O'Brien is absent. The item is therefore enacted. Um, that appointment is approved. Let's move on then to. Yeah, let's. <laughs> I'm not listening, were you? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> to the orders, please. We have a, a tabled order. The first uh, order is tabled. It's my uh, best information at this point. The Zoning Board of Appeals has voted. It has not um, uh, reduced the decision to writing, and it is not signed yet. Motion to move from the table. Way. Second. The motion is to remove from the table and second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Is there a subsequent motion? Motion to place back on the table. Second. Motion is to place this item on the table, and it's been seconded. Is there discussion? Thank Councilor Cameron. You, um, we had a, a bit of a conversation uh, via email. We'll, we'll take this out, out uh, for the next meeting. We need to take a look at what the can do to make sure that it's all in order with the previous meeting. Uh, so for the next meeting. Very well. Other discussion? Uh, hearing none, uh, I guess it could be a roll call vote. All those in favor of recommitting this, replacing, let's see, what is that? Recommitting this to the table, say aye. 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 Opposed? Back on the table. Ordinance, I'm sorry, ordinances. We have um, late file. A late yes, file on the, regarding In Street. This is order number two, late file. Uh, it goes on for a page and a half. It is uh, sponsored by Councillor Eigeman, and there's also a supporting memorandum from Andy Port, Director of Planning. Motion to approve. I'll second that. Is there a second? I'll second. Second, Councilor Herzog. Is there any discussion? Councilor Eigerman? Uh, yes, this is a cleanup uh, brought to us by Andy Port, the Director of Planning. Uh, the previous order that we approved back on August 11th uh, omitted the book and page number from the Registry of Deeds. In order to get the money from the state, we need to put the book and page number. That's all that changes. I urge you to vote yes. <laughs> the little things. Is there any additional comments? May I ask the planning director a clarifying question? Uh, what's the time pressure here? Is it necessary for us to take two readings on this tonight, or can we wait until our next general meeting? Uh, well, I, uh, it's this is necessary to do it tonight, mainly because the deadline for reimbursement requests, including this particular type of documentation, which is recording at the registry, uh, is due on Monday of next week. So I need to record this document this week. So it was brought to my attention uh, last week, and that's why I'm bringing it to as a late file tonight. I apologize. We don't typically want to do late files. <coughs> it's necessary in this case. All right. I'm going to ask the clerk for a... Um, uh, a, a way to accomplish that if that became the rule of the council? It's in order I would do one reading. I'd do a roll call for the record. Um, and that would approved. be sufficient to meet uh, your requirements, Andy? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Alternatively, we could have uh, suspended the rules and taken two readings. I, I take that back. It should be a motion to waive the rules and approve. Um, so stated. So moved. So moved. The clerk could restate the motion, please, then. Motion to waive the rules and approve in one reading. Um, Order number two, it, um, it's, a, it's always one reading for an order. However, our rules say when an order, an ordinance comes in, it goes right to committee. Okay, prior to accepting that motion, we would have to vacate the previous motion. Does the... Yes, I'll, I'll voluntarily vacate and replace. And the second? Oh, sure. Okay, <laughs> and therefore, Councillor Vogel's motion is appropriate at this time? And it was seconded by... Ed. Thank you. Councillor Cameron is the second. Is there any further discussion of this matter? Hearing none, we'll have a roll call on it. Councilor Harquist. Yes. Councilor Hirsaud. Yes. Councilor Kinsey. Yes. Councilor Tontar. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Connell. Yes. Councilor Cronin. Yes. Councilor Eigerman. Yes. Councilor Junta. Yes. I believe the matter passes. It does. When I move on to ordinances, this is a uh, second reading. Ordinance number one. Section 13176, resident parking. I'm going to um, delete uh, Beacon Avenue Northeast. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. We have a motion to approve. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we'll take a roll call. Yes. Motion to approve. Uh, <laughs> second reading, ordinance yes. number one. Yes. Council Harquist. Yes. Pearsock. Yes. Council Kinsey. Yes. Council Tonto. Yes. Council Vogel. Yes. Council Cameron. Yes. Councilor Cronin. Yes. yes. Councilor Eigerman. Yes. Councilor Junta. Yes. Councilor Connell. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was quick. It was. Members are aware of the clock. We'll move on to committee items. Uh, budget and finance. Councilor <sighs> Tonto. 
I'd like to remove item number nine, tax increment financing plan for UFT Technologies. Uh, I'm sorry, did I hear a second? Second. Thank you, second from Councillor Cameron. Councillor Tantar, would you like to hear about this? Oh. Did we vote on removal? Do we have to? Oh, I'm sorry, you're remove? correct. Uh, I'm, I'm the one who <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is like <laughs> through the looking glass. <laughs> Except corrections from the Greek chorus. Um, this is Bougie all those day. in favor of um, taking this out of committee, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion to approve. Second. Second. And I have multiple seconds. The clerk can make his choice. Um, Discussion, Councillor Tonter. Uh, uh, Budget and Finance Committee met uh, last Thursday, and we met with uh, the principals from uh, UFP, and I believe uh, Mr. W. David Smith, is, was he, is still here, uh, who is the um, Vice President of Operations? I believe, yes, there he is, there we go. Oh, Palm, that's right, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I screwed that, I'm sorry, I apologize. Oh yeah, that's that card. No. Uh, um, so I, th I think there's one thing that's very important here that uh, I think the councilors understand. I'm not sure that everyone out there uh, understands. Uh, tax incremental finance plan um, it does not affect the taxes, the property taxes that UFP would pay on the current assessment of the building that is there. The plan only affects uh, the additional value that would take place when UFP uh, in, uh, improves the structure and, and enlarges it. Um, so um, the, the way it works is over a 10 year period of time, 10%, uh, uh, the first year they don't pay, uh, the, it's construct, uh, the first year, 100% uh, of uh, the new value is not taxed and then 90% and, and until and over 10 years it goes to zero. Uh, and, and so that plan gives an incentive to UFP to, uh, to get the, uh, the, the construction underway, which I think is, is in the city's interest. Um, a couple things uh, that have influenced our unanimous vote on this for approval. One is we have had successful TIFs in the past. One was for Mark Ritchie Company and the other was for Rochester Electronics. They worked, they did bring uh, additional jobs into the city. Um, and uh, this is the, the uh, company, it's going to at first bring around 170, 175 employees uh, to Newburyport uh, after the expansion uh, up to maybe 195 employees. Um, they, are, um, as I understand it, uh, an engineering firm, they're going to, uh, uh, they, they engineer uh, among a number of things, um, packaging. Uh, which uh, for specialized, they have specialized manufacturing employees, uh, they have high skilled people coming in, um, and you know, we think that uh, the tax increment plan is uh, well worth supporting, so we urge you to do so. Thank you, Councillor. Other comments? Councillor Genta. Um, I just, I urge you to uh, support this today. You know, when I was running for council, uh, a year or so ago, you know, I've knocked on many doors. There were a lot of disappointment um, in, the, in regards to Cabot staying, uh, leaving us. And there were quite a few employees that were unhappy that they, they lost their jobs. And uh, for us to have an opportunity to get this building up and running again, being part of the city, um, I'm just really excited about that. I am, and the thought of being able to expand the building, maybe double the amount of jobs, maybe some of the residents getting an opportunity again to get back to work. I'm just really excited about this, so I urge you to vote in favor of it. Councilor Herzog. Thank you, if I could direct a question to the chair, actually a two-part question. Part one is uh, have any of the city's permitting agencies, such as the zoning board or the planning board, et cetera, have they already weighed in? Uh, they did not weigh in with us. This is a separate issue. I mean, they have to go before the Conservation uh, Commission, do that perhaps, or the Planning Board. So, uh, I mean, we, we, we looked at the financing, and that does not, uh, our approval of this does not suggest that we approval for anything else. 
Thank you. Andy, would you like to respond to that question or uh, em embellish the comments of town? Andy, Council we're Council. planning director. If the council wishes, I can summarize. Uh, I, we have had meetings actually reviewing the conceptual plans, two iterations of the conceptual plan that UFP has for expanding their building and their property. Um, and it all that complies with zoning, uh, there would be the necessary to have a slight variance needed from a property setback, but that is a really a non-issue. It's in a neighborhood where there's no abutters to be concerned about. Um, I don't see any reason why that variance would not be granted. And it's really just um, due to the encroachment of wellness and other sides, they have to use that area of the property due to the expansion. Um, so I've reviewed the conceptual plans. Obviously, they'll have to fully engineer that as they go forward for construction, but I see no problems with them getting the approvals from both the Conservation Commission and the Zoning Board of Appeals. So just as a quick follow-up follow then, if I may. Yes. Um, if at any point, <coughs> if supposing the City Council approves this, the Mayor signs it, the other party signs it, if at any point in the future, over the next 10 years, uh, should any of our poor permitting agencies uh, suggest ways to uh, amend that new structure? Would that have any bearing on the contract? Uh, well, they have the way that it's written. There's an expansion. There's a, the clause itself is not specifically 100,000 square feet, but a range close to that. So if you look, read the terminology in that paragraph, so it, the city assumes that there'll be a range close to 100,000 square feet of expansion there. Um, and like I said, I expect I, I can tell you there's virtually no chance that that it will not be approved uh, by the boards. So I have not only ha having a knowledge of the boards and how they operate, but also in terms of our own zoning and what they've done, you know, in case yep. law previously. I have no doubt that the project will be approved. Um, it may be modified slightly in terms of layout in some minor way, but, um, but only minor way. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Cronin. Yeah, I just want to echo uh, Councilor Junta's uh, statement of support for this, uh, for this uh, purchase and for our um, u utilizing a TIF. Um, one thing that um, I did bring up in, um, in committee and I'd remind um, Mr. Port is that we'd like, you know, maybe a condition if we can get it of uh, traffic restricted going through the neighborhoods um, and have everything enter and, and leave through the industrial area. Because um, I know that area has been um, extremely sensitive to, to traffic. So that would, that would be something that I just wanted to put on the record. And as was said, there are no approvals yet from CONCOM or anything else. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, hearing none, uh, I'll ask for a roll call vote on this matter. So motion to approve um, the TIF order for UFP Technologies. Councilor Harquist. Yes. Councilor Hirsog. Yes. Councilor Kinsey. Yes. Councilor Tontar. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Cronin. Yes. Councilor Agerman. Yes. Councilor Junta. Yes. Councilor Connell. Yes. So the uh, matter is referred to the mayor for signing. And uh, we want to thank our new tenants uh, for joining us in Newburyport. Get to work. Okay. Any other matters coming out of your committee? I would like to take item number eight, uh, school department um, school expenses for the lunch program. Move to remove. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of taking this out of committee? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's out. Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second, Councillor Cronin. Discussion? Mr. Tontar. Uh, you know, again, we discussed this last Thursday, uh, and Nancy Lysa came from the school uh, department and appeared before us. Um, the last year when we passed the budget, we put uh, $50,000 into contingency uh, as part of the contingency for the school uh, department, uh, specifically for school lunches. Uh, and so we have to transfer it out of the contingency fund to make it available for school lunches, and that's why that's before us. Um, we did, in committee, we did uh, ask um, whether uh, it was sufficient, uh, and we, they, they because we're just transferring 25,000 out, we may need more, all right? Uh, we also did raise a question as to um, whether or not it, um, the city might be better off uh, just pulling out of the uh, federal program and changing the lunches uh, if we could save money. It was the sense of the school department that um, 
that it, we would not be better off. We would lose uh, about $113,000, $119,000. Uh, it, it's been running around there for the past couple of years in federal aid, and the sense was not that they would make it up, um, so that they, they were arguing that we continue the uh, program. They have made some changes that have made it somewhat more popular for the students um, and hope to uh, improve the performance. So we urge unanimously that we pass this. Thank you. Any other discussion? Councilor Gentle. Sure. This is an item um, that Joint Ed has brought up a few times over the last year. Um, in, the, in the previous school year, the school lunch program lost about $90,000. Um, this, um, <coughs> this is something that's happened because of the new federal regulations. Uh, children aren't, they're not eating the food, they're not purchasing the food, they're bringing it from home. A lot of the food is being thrown away. Um, some changes have been made, but it, it's really, this is a, this should be a self-sustaining program, and right now it's not. Um, so there are a lot of questions being passed around on what do we do about it. Um, but this obviously is an indication that we're sliding uh, into the red again with the lunch program. So there is definitely more discussion that needs to be had because we can't continue to lose money on something that should be self-sustaining. Thank you, Councilor. Other comments? Then what's the will of the Council? I guess we could vote on it. Voice. And uh, this would be a voice vote in this instance. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The matter passes. Uh, is that it from Budget and Finance? Uh, I would uh, move to remove item number 10, the uh, auditor's mid-year report. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of removing this from committee? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's out. Uh, move to approve. Um, well, actually, move to receive and file. Second. I apologize. The motion is to receive and file and has been seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Good. Is there anything else, Chair Council? We're done. You're done. General Government has nothing. Joint Education? Nothing, sir. License and permits? Nothing at this time. Neighborhood and City Services? No. Planning and Development? Nothing to report. Public safety? Unfortunately, yes. Oh, um, I thought we got away clean. <laughs> I would move, move to remove collectively items one and five, um, which are parking on State Street and resident parking. Second. Second. <coughs> Moved to remove <clears throat> items one and five collectively. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? They're out. Is there a motion? Uh, motion on item one to receive and file. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, there's a, a later item, um, item, item uh, two, that covers the same ground, so one is superfluous. Let's get rid of it. Any other comment? Councilor Cronin. Could I make just a friendly um, amendment and ask to remove item two as well oh, I, in this? I, I think that's going to have to be, um, is your, yep. your motion is to remove it from committee? Yes. Is there a second to remove it from committee? Item I'll two. second that. Any discussion? All those in favor of removing item two as well from committee, say aye. 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 Opposed? So items one, two, and five are out of committee. Okay, if I may. Uh, so, and I'll do it. Councillor Eigerman, yeah. I believe you have a motion to. Since all three are out, and I'm, I'm the sponsor of all three, I would like to move uh, to receive and file uh, item one, to approve item two, and to approve item five as amended in committee today. Uh, the chair is disinclined to accept that motion. I think they should be acted upon independently. I think it might be cleaner for the record and uh, cause the clerk less heartache. <laughs> Okay. I, I'm just going to make one small suggestion for clarity's sake. What if I read what we're deleting? or we're, Because they, they okay. begin to look like... All right. Let's what get what the receive and file item out first, Council. Fine. Let's in, do that one. In the Motion to receive and file number one. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Can I read that one to make sure we know? Yes. Okay. Please. Please. Point of order. Um, 
Uh, the the one I, dates. All right. The, the, I think they're in the, in the correct order in the packet. Right. They're dated. So it would be January 26th, section 13-174. Delete from the table State Street uh, for a period longer than four hours between the hours of six and seven on the westerly side from the intersection of Route 1 and State, continuing for a distance of 1,250, correct? Uh, yes, and it was going to be adding to the table other language, so it just gets rid of it. <coughs> but this one is uh, this one is the the one you want to receive and file then is dated uh, November tenth. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So um, I was correct so far, except the date is November tenth, and we're adding to the table. No point of order. No. Point of order. We are. Excuse me, counselors. Let's go one at a time. Uh, some clarification from the clerk, please. What yeah. are you asking? So. Um, Help me out, Counselor. Which one are we receiving and filing? Okay. Just to delete. If I may, let me, let me clarify. Okay. Last year, we amended this table to add a regulation on State Street. It's in the wrong section of the code. So it needs to be taken out of section 13-174 and put in 13-180, uh, which is item 5. So all we're trying to achieve here is to delete that sec uh, this, this language. So the, the ordinance that was introduced on November 10th was going to change the language. That is going to be received and filed. We're not changing it. We're deleting it. <coughs> so we re we're receiving and filing uh, the November 10th version. And uh, we are, I'm, I'm going to make a motion to approve the January 26th to delete it from the section. That works. Thank you. So it's the uh, motion to receive and file, November 10th. It deletes from the table a section on State Street as previously read. It says on either side. And we're going to add to the table um, for a period longer than four hours on the westerly side. This is uh, a motion to receive and file this November 10th ordinance. Is that correct, Councilor Argument? That's correct. Let's get rid of it. Right. It's wrong. And that right. was seconded by? Uh, we have a motion, and it has been seconded. Does everyone Second. know what we're acting on? <laughs> um, let's do a roll call. Is there any discussion first? Councilor Genta. I, just a point of order. Are we deleting January 26th or November 10th? November 10th. Just because they're not, they're, there's no markings on them. So. Okay. The, the item one is the November 10th version. That is going to be received and filed. That's Perfect. the motion before us. OK. Does everyone understand that motion, then? And we'll take a roll call on this matter. Motion to receive and file ordinance uh, dated November 10th, 2014, relative to section 13 174. Councilor Harquist? Yes. Councilor Herzog? Yep. Councilor Kinsey? Yes. Councilor Tontar? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Cronin? Yes. Councilor Eigenman? Yes. Councilor Junta? Yes. Councilor Connell? Yes. Done. Okay, the pain will be over soon. <laughs> okay. All right, so. Is there any other item we'd like to take out of committee, Council? Well, we, are, we already have two uh, others that are out. Go ahead. So You're right. Okay, so the, the second one is the January 26th version, which will effectively delete, if you vote for it, will delete language about Upper State Street from this section where it does not belong. And then when we get to the last item, five, it will be restored in the proper section, which is resident parking. So let's vote on this one next, if we may. I would move to approve. Item 2, January 26th, Amendment to Section 13-174. Second. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I'm going to ask the clerk to clarify, because we have two items dated yep. January 26th. This is the one. Could you read the uh, oh, deletion yes, yeah, from the yeah, table? This is the one with respect to State Street. Let me read it. So this is a motion to approve January 26, 2015, Ordinance, Section 13-174. Delete from the table, State Street. Again, uh, for a period longer than four hours between 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. during the weekdays, excluding holidays on the westerly side from the intersection of Route 1 and State and continuing in the northerly direction, approximately 1,250 feet. Got it. Does everyone know which item we're acting on? What's our status from a parliamentary standpoint here? Have we a motion on the table? We have a, we have a motion. Yeah, it's seconded. A motion Is there any, and, then, and it's been seconded. Is there any additional <laughs> discussion then? Hearing none, we'll go to a roll call. Councilor Harquist. Yes. Councilor Herzog. Yes. Councilor Kinsey. Yes. Councilor Tontas. Yes. 
Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Cronin. Yes. Councilor Agamon. Yes. Councilor Junta. Yes. Councilor Connell. Yes. Okay. Are there any other items, Councilor? Uh, motion to approve on first reading item five, an ordinance to amend section 13 180, dated January 26, and running four pages. Second the motion. With, whoa, can I finish it? Uh, with, with, an amend, <laughs> with amended language reviewed by Public Safety Committee this evening, which I'll read into the record. That's the motion. Second the motion. There's a second. Do you want to read that into the uh, record, please, the yes. amendments that you've proposed? Okay, so the amendment would be, this is the, the longer ordinance. It would create a new section, A4, entitled In-Street Mixed-Use Area. In-street mixed-use area shall mean the contiguous area generally bounded by Market Square to the northeast, State Street to the southeast, Pleasant Street to the southwest, and the in-street mall to the northwest, including all parcels within Assessor's Block 4, with the exception of parcels 41, 41A, 41, uh, 42, which is the in-street playground, and 430, which is in-street mall itself. Then, the substance at the end will be a new subsection J. Uh, which reads, in-street mixed-use area. A bona fide hardship exists for residents of the in-street mixed-use area caused by unique or special conditions there that preclude designation of a residential parking permit zone incorporating any of the adjacent streets which are commercial in nature. Notwithstanding anything in this section to the contrary, the parking clerk or his designee shall issue residential parking permits for use within the Green Street parking lot, Assessor's Parcel 3-28, by no more than four households that reside within the in-street mixed-use area. I believe that's self-explanatory. There are more details. The clerk has all the language. Uh, to speak to the merits. Uh, this was discussed at the parking committee and then again in public safety this evening. We have a situation where people are marooned who live on in-street and upper story apartments. Uh, they cannot park, park on, they can't have a residential parking program because those are all commercial streets. The only viable solution is to offer a few of them, a handful, first come, first serve, is the way it's written in the ordinance, four placards with no visitor rights to relieve them of uh, this burden. And we took testimony on this at the parking committee uh, earlier this year. Um, I, I welcome more debate over it, but I, I, and I don't know what the, park, what the public safety recommended, if anything, on this. Uh, discussion. Councilor Cameron? Thank you. I'm a little befuddled. Um, so what you just read to us is not in here? Is that I'm sorry, was that something that's been amended to this? Or I that's correct. It was amended in public safety this evening. Okay. So we don't have it actually before us. <coughs> but ordinance is taking two votes. We could move this on tonight. I'm going to ask for a ruling from the clerk. Uh, under the rules, may we take an amendment offered in uh, in oral form uh, on the floor that has not been included in the packets and distributed to the members prior to the meeting? Yeah, I would, I would say sure, Mr. President. I mean, it's done all the time. Um, ordinances go into committee, come out of committee with changes made. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, this ordinance has been in committee for how long? For a uh, month. Fair enough. Um, Any additional discussion then? Hearing none, we'll proceed to a roll call. Okay, this is approved first reading with the new sections as uh, read by Councillor Argerman. Uh, Councillor Harquist. Yes. Councillor Hersog. Yep. Councillor Kinsey. Yes. Councillor Tontar. Yes. Councillor Vogel. Yes. Councillor Cameron. Yes. Councillor Cronin. Yes. Councillor Argerman. Yes. Councillor Junta. Yes. Councillor Connell. Yes. Thank you, Councillor. Basically over. Is there anything else out of your committee? Yes, back to baby steps. Um, motion to remove item three, parking restricted on Norman Ave. Second. The motion just removed from committee and it's been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's out. Motion approved. Second. And seconded by Councilor Kinkar. <coughs> Discussion? Councilor Genta. I'm just going to uh, speak about this ordinance and then the one that will be coming out of committee um, in a few seconds. Uh, we had a meeting with the whole neighborhood, Norman and Murphy. We met with all the neighbors. 
Um, we discussed the, the needs that they had. Everybody had uh, different needs. Some people wanted no parking at all in front of their houses. Some people want timed parking um, for various reasons. So what we did was we kind of custom made the streets to what, what folks wanted. Um, with the help of the parking clerk, we put the signs up temporarily for a month and a half. Um, and all reports back are people are happy with the signage that we put up, so we're looking to make them permanent. And I, I urge you to vote yes. Very well. Is there additional discussion? And uh, Richard, what was your maybe, comment? Maybe I should read it for the record. It's a motion to approve first reading. Uh, it's section 13, 168, Nauman Avenue. No parking between the hours of 7 a.m and 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. weekdays, accepting holidays on the south side and north side from Murphy Avenue for a distance of 170 feet, running in an easterly direction. Okay, is everyone familiar with this now? Further discussion? Hearing none, we'll take a roll call on this item. Councilor Harquist. Yes. Councilor Hersog. Yes. Councilor Kinsey. Yes. Councilor Tontar. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Cronin. Yes. Councilor Igam. Yes. Councilor Junta. Yes. Councilor Connell. Yes. Okay, public safety. Motion Anything? to remove item four, parking restricted on Murphy Ave. Second. The motion is to remove item number four from committee. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's out. Do I, hear, do I hear a motion on this matter? Motion to approve. I'm sorry. Second. And it's been seconded by Councillor Genta. Discussion? Councillor Herzog. Yes, just to, uh, if I could just a ask a query to the uh, clerk, as he, who also acts as the parking clerk. As we add more and more streets to your responsibilities um, and your staff's responsibilities, I'm just wondering, are we all set? currently with staffing and we're adding more streets to parking restrictions? Yeah, I think I can um, speak to that. This is a good example of um, it looks complicated. It looks like it needs a lot of enforcement. In fact, it doesn't. Okay. Um, they've been by, people have been um, complying almost 100% as far as I know. Yes. It's an um, example of good citizenship. Thank you. <laughs> Give me a gold star. Um, any further discussion? Hearing, no one, hearing none, we'll move to a roll call vote on this item. Councilor Harquist? Yes. Councilor Harrisog? Yes. Councilor Kinsey? Yes. Councilor Tontar? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Cronin? Yes. Councilor Agam? Yes. Councilor Junta? Yes. And Council President Pro Tem Connell? Yes. Any other matters in public safety? The bloodletting is over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can almost all go home. Mm -hmm. <coughs> almost. Public utilities. Yes, Mr. President, I would like to uh, remove from committee uh, number two. The home rule petition. Home rule uh, petition on, uh, on water fluoridation. Is there a second to remove this from committee? Yes. Any discussion? All those in favor of removing this item from committee, say aye. 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 All those opposed? <coughs> it's out. Motion to approve the petition. Is there a second? Second. There is a second. Discussion. Councilor Herzog. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, members of the City Council. I have a prepared statement. Um, if we don't understand the past, we will never understand the future. Community water fluoridation began in January 1945 in the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Three months earlier, on October 1st, 1944, the Journal of the American Dental Association published an editorial that described sodium fluoride as a, quote, highly toxic substance, and that, quote, the potentialities for harm far outweigh those for good. The ADA editorial said that ingestion of fluoride can cause, quote, developmental disturbances in bones as osteosclerosis, spondylosis, and osteopetrosis, as well as goiter, 
and we cannot afford to run the risk of producing such serious systemic disturbances in applying what is at present a doubtful procedure intended to prevent the development of dental disfigurements among children. Isn't it curious that 71 years after that editorial, the ADA objects to anyone who cautions against it? Six months ago, in August of 2014, the nation of Israel banned fluoridating water. The Israeli Ministry of Health says the following on their website regarding why they banned it. Quote, 1% of the water is used for drinking, while 99% of the water is intended for other uses, industry, agriculture, flushing toilets, etc. There is also scientific evidence that fluoride in large amounts can lead to damage to health. When fluoride is supplied via drinking water, there is no control regarding the amount of fluoride actually consumed, which could lead to excessive consumption. Supply of fluoridated water forces those who do not so wish to also consume water with added fluoride. This approach is therefore not accepted in most countries of the world." End quote. Mr. President, the Newburyport Board of Health is not telling us the truth. They are merely backing the State Department of Public Health and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, who believe that fluoride is good for us. But if fluoride is so good, why are entire nations banning it? Maybe, just maybe, Newburyport should follow the lead of Amesbury, Salisbury, Merrimack, Rowley, Georgetown, Methuen, Wilmington, and other cities and towns in Massachusetts. Fifteen years ago, the 15 years ago in 2000, the townspeople of Wilmington voted against fluoridation. The town's former health director, Gregory Erickson, presented a report to their Board of Health prior to the Wilmington Board of Health voting two to one in opposition to fluoride. There's a goat. <laughs> I'd like to read one excerpt from the former health director's report in Wilmington. He says, as a quote, we have come to discover that many of the elements that we commonly used were dangerous to health. We removed lead from paint and pipes as we learned that it caused lead poisoning. We removed asbestos from our schools and public buildings because of the remote possibility that the smallest exposure could cause asbestosis. We have done this by passing laws prohibiting the use of these elements. We should look at the many countries that have prohibited the use of fluoride in water supplies. We should look at the long list of cities in the US that have changed their position and reversed their previous action to fluoridate and have rejected its use. Mr. President, the people of Newburyport voted in November 1967 and approved fluoridation. They said yes by a vote of 4,449 to 1,120 with 509 blanks. Two years later, in 1969, the Newburyport Water Works began fluoridating the water supply here, and we added fluoride to selected properties in Newbury and West Newbury. The towns of Newbury and West Newbury never voted. Newbury residents who want fluoride removed from their systems have contacted me. They support this home rule petition. I ask you to join me and say yes to this petition. The original petition sponsored by Councilor Kinsey and I used language from Rockport's petition. But our solicitor suggested we use Amesbury's petition, and that is what you see before you tonight. This product is ready to be sent to Beacon Hill. If you vote yes tonight, then this petition will go to the Massachusetts legislature, and the general court will vote. If they vote yes, then the referendum is added to our November ballot. Mr. President, all we are voting on tonight is whether we want the people of Newburyport to vote. <coughs> In the biblical book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, it says, quote, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Mr. President, I want to empower the people of the city. It doesn't matter to me how they vote. All that matters is they're granted the opportunity to vote but they can't vote unless the city council says yes. In the study of economics, the precautionary principle says that if there is any doubt about a policy, we should be cautious about proceeding. The scientific community used to think lead and asbestos were safe. Few believed lead was a toxin. The Board of Health thinks fluoride is safe. Is fluoride a toxin? If a resident does not want to drink fluoride, I want that resident to vote no. Otherwise, a person can vote yes, but the person can't vote without this petition. Thanks for listening. I'm willing to take any questions. On the matter of putting this matter, this item on the ballot, um, is there other discussion? 
Councillor Vogel. They say a marathon starts at mile 20, huh? All right. <laughs> so the uh, issue before us is indeed whether or not this should go on the ballot. It is not about whether or not we believe fluoride is good or bad. It's about whether or not it should go on the ballot. And there's been plenty said about whether it's good or bad. I stand against putting it on the ballot. And I stand against putting it on the ballot for a number of reasons. We discussed it in committee a bit about the fact that we supply Newberry and West Newberry with water. If we put it on the ballot, Newburyport votes for it, those people have no say. Plain and simple. Secondly, as it stands, we do have a choice. If you do not want fluoride in your water, don't drink it. If you don't want fluoride in your water and you don't want to drink it, or you want to drink it, put a, put a filter on it. They're inexpensive and you can filter out the fluoride. If you don't want to bathe in it, for less than $500, you can put a full whole house system in place that will take the fluoride out of your water. You do have a choice whether or not you want to be exposed to fluoride in your water or not. I've, I've researched it. I know people in the water filtration business. Come the fall, the election is only going to be for city council and for school committee members. It'll be a very low turnout. <laughs> that speaks a lot about us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, we're all at risk, and I stand here at risk. If you don't agree with me and you vote me out, you know, so be it. But we, we all have our say, and, and, and we, we need to do the best that we possibly can. And, and putting this on the ballot will be very, very, very divisive in our community, and we don't need any more divisiveness. We have mounds of, of, of snow. We have, we have um, sewer systems and water systems that are inoperable. We have sidewalks that need repair. We have plenty to talk about. We don't need to debate whether or not we need fluoride in the water. There's so much out there that we need to be doing, and we just don't have the time. And, and this leads to my primary concern. When you have people that are very, very, very passionate about a subject, you tend to go overboard and you tend to use what I would call propaganda. And one of the most disgusting <coughs> issues of propaganda is putting out this piece of paper that says that this is labeled poison. Well, I did some research on this. This label that's on here is a United Nations shipping label. This, is a, this complies, this is the hazardous materials handling. Our, our code of federal regulations by abiding, is, is abiding by, um, the, 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 shipping, uh, the, the shipping of it is abiding by the code of federal regulations. And yes, they have to put it on here because if you were to swallow X amount of pounds or whatever it is of, of sodium fluoride, you would be poisoned, which holds true for just about every ingredient that's in about everything that's in our house. It's silly. And so you put out this stuff and you go, well, it's poison, it must be bad for you. Well, I'll tell you what, you go through the list of things that are labeled in such a way and you'll find them all over your house. You'll find them in your, you'll find them in the, um, um, well, chlorine. You know, what would we do without chlorine? You'd find them in, your, in, in the in ingredients that, are in, that you wash your clothes with. You'd find them in, in just about everything. And if there's enough of it and you breathe enough of it or you swallow enough of it, you're gonna be poisoned. This is propaganda. And that's what I'm fearful of. We have a letter from a constituent, and this, just, this about sums it up. Oh, well, well, just one more thing. When you watch television and you see commercials for <coughs> medicine, for, for the, you know, solve the world's problems or solve your health problems by taking this, half that commercial is, yeah, but. It may cause this, it may cause that, it may cause the other thing. We're, there's all kinds of warnings on everything that's out there. We have a, we have a, we received a email from a constituent and I, I'm not gonna mention her name, but, but she sums it up just wonderfully, and if she's listening, I thank you so much. She says, in conclusion, if you honestly feel that there is a great conspiracy, including the CDC, the AMA, the ADA, the AAP, etc., 
then I can certainly understand why you would want to support this measure, though I definitely question your judgment. If you do not believe in some great conspiracy, then you should not consider sending this, ma this matter of science to be voted on. <laughs> Which do you believe? Is there an enormous multinational conspiracy involving a horde of dental, medical, and scientific organizations, as well as millions of individuals, to kill everybody by fluoridating, fluoridating our tap water? I mean, really? Are, are, are we that paranoid that we think that all of these organizations are out there ready to, to, to poison us? If it comes down to it and the research is there and it comes out that we should not have fluoride, fluoride in the water, I believe in the scientific approach. I believe in scientists. We have this, this list that came from our own health department. As you all well know, I may be difficult for me to speak highly of the health department, but actually, <laughs> I don't take anything personally, Dr. Blair. And I hope you don't as well. <laughs> but we have this list. I mean, look at, look at, look at the, the organizations and the people in the community. This is not a public debate. This is a public health issue. Let those people that are understanding of it t help us. But let's not. When you go out on the campaign trail, what, what do you find? The majority of people in this community are on the bus at 6 o'clock, they get home at 7 o'clock, and they, they barely read the daily news, though it doesn't take much time. They barely read the daily news, and, and, and that's it. They just don't have time to be doing all of this, and we shouldn't be exposing them to it. Thank you very much. Not that I'm passionate. Councillor Kinsey. We were wrong. Like, if, if the, the pro fluoridationists find out we're wrong at any given po moment, at any point, I just don't personally, I can't have it hanging on me. I'm not a professional uh, in that regard, and neither are any of the 11 of us. I need to know that I gave the public an opportunity, because that is just, I have to have a clear conscience in that regard. Because um, this has always been a matter of the informed consent from my point of view. It has not been about the tit for tat in science as much. Um, it's the only reason I co-sponsored it, because I really do, I am a believer in giving the public an opportunity to sound off on matters as, especially as personal as the water they're ingesting. Um, so that's really where I come from on that. Um, I can cut through half of what I said. I just, one of the things I did notice, though, in some of the arguments that were coming out earlier, um, and it's just a, it's something I just noticed, is when we're, it was, the, it was the comparison of what we're, when we're debating the plastic bag ban. Um, we had talked a lot about um, the European countries that had led the way with the plastic bag, bag bans, and we kind of held them in high regard in regards to that. And we, we talked about wanting to emulate, them, to emulate them. We also discussed wanting to be leaders among cities and towns in the Commonwealth and to be in the forefront. And I'm like, well, is this one of those opportunities? It's, it's a, we talked about that and held it in such high regard, and here we are. If we took the same argument, is giving the public a chance to sound off, making sure it's not any of the 11 of us, is it an opportunity to do so? And then let it play out. And that's, that's my piece there. Thank you. Councillor Agerman. I'm the third member of the Public Utilities Committee, and we, we did not uh, put out a recommendation because we wanted to have a floor debate on this, and we wanted to be respectful of the sponsors. But I, I want, for the record, to note I, I differ a little bit uh, from Councillor Vogel, not in opposing uh, the motion, because I do oppose it. I don't want to put this on the ballot, and I'll give my reasons. But where I differ with him is that I do think I have to evaluate fluoride. Um, I, I, I spoke at our last meeting. I had a very easy time opposing the ballot measure for something that we had voted on and had gone through the process with plastic bags. This is different in that we haven't voted on it, or at least this body hasn't voted on it since 1967. But I still think it's not appropriate for the ballot. And I know that may seem uh, patronizing because you think, well, the voters themselves know what's best for them. That's true. But also, we do have a duty to protect those that are vulnerable. And there was very good testimony about that earlier tonight. And I, I am, I, I, like, uh, it was Mr. Curtis out, out of Gloucester who said, question everything. I'm one of those. I question everything. I do. Just because the ADA wants something doesn't mean that I think it's okay. 
Uh, so for example, it actually <coughs> helps me to feel that fluoride uh, is, is safe because uh, all the practitioners that are saying you should keep it in the water are testifying against their own interests because it would be more business for them, frankly, if everybody had bad teeth. So that speaks volumes to me. That's how cynical I am. Uh, but, uh, when I talk about the vulnerable, I mean, it, it is, it, just as Counselor Kinsey was saying, she doesn't want to make the mistake of, say, poisoning our children, I mean, to put it in stark terms. I got that. But I look at it the other way. I'm persuaded on the other side of the coin we would be making a terrible mistake for kids right now, like my kids who are young, by not giving them fluoride. And, and you know, I have personal experience with this. You know, my parents did not have fluoride. They're terrible teeth. Um, uh, you know, I lived in Newburyport, Mass, and Cambridge, Mass. And I've always had fluoride water. I've never had a cavity. My sister never had a cavity. It's night and day. And I, you know, all of the scientific evidence that we've gotten, I do feel I have to evaluate on behalf of the voters and not just throw it to them. Um, has been, you know, overwhelmingly peer-reviewed. There's a lot of good to fluoride. Fluorosis is definitely something that could be bad, but from my understanding, it's a cosmetic problem. Um, it's not something that disturbs me. So I have to say, I have to say to myself, okay, on balance, in order to protect poor kids who may not get toothpaste, who may not have dental insurance. By the way, I didn't have dental insurance until I got this job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have to think fluoride is a good thing. I'm not running away from that. I, I, do think, I do think fluoride is a public benefit, and I don't think this is something appropriate to throw to the voters, even if it were high turnout. We took a lot of testimony. I, I just don't think it, it lends itself to a simple ballot initiative, and I, I'll be voting no. Additional comment. Councillor Cameron. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, pro tem. Uh, I just want to uh, kind of echo somewhat uh, what Councillor Eigerman was saying. I, I don't feel that this discussion has only been about uh, the, the practicality of, of putting this on the ballot and the reasons for the ballot. We need to look at the content. So to me, this has always been somewhat about fluoride because you need to be informed about the, the content of that before you can really make a good decision about whether to, uh, to put it on a ballot. So despite the President Pro Tem's uh, imploring of folks to just talk about the ballot. I mean, clearly we're talking about fluoride. And we're talking about opinions, we're talking about facts, but we really need to, to use those facts to talk about the science. And as Councillor Eigerman said, when you take this on balance as a public health measure, we had an economist um, speak earlier um, at public comment, uh, public health is a public good, and you've got to balance the good with the bad uh, when you make these decisions. And uh, it's been said a couple of times by uh, Mr. Teichner um, online and, uh, and also earlier tonight, when in doubt, leave it out. I don't have any doubt that fluoride has benefits and I don't have any doubt that there are not any major um, uh, medical issues caused by this at all. Other than fluorosis, which is a, a you know a fairly minor uh, and rare occurrence, which is white you know what causes whitening of the teeth, well I think that's kind of what we want. Um, that that does not sound uh, you know very harmful to me. And I think people that were making the case to not put this on the ballot when they cited other people are loving to throw out arsenic, lead. Uh, the word China gets thrown out a lot, which makes me you know wonder what the. Uh, uh, what the uh, potentially racist implications are there. Uh, when you throw in big pharma, big government, um, you're, you're throwing around a lot of weighted words that are going to scare the hell out of people. That doesn't scare me, and, and if this does go to a ballot, I have no, no question that Newburyport re would reject it. Part of my brain would love to see this go on the ballot and hash it out, because I'm not afraid of that divisiveness. You look at the daily news comments, it's like the old days when people are really flaming each other. I'm sure we could get through that. And yes, sometimes Big Brother does make a mistake, but I'm sure the voters of Newburyport would be intelligent enough to do the right thing here for their own public health. And again, people may not want to drink fluoridated water, but there's no harmful effects of it. So, you know, there's lots of things that we want to do, and we're not able to do that because there are laws that, that govern our behavior with each other, the things we ingest. And, and as I said, 
you know, we can look at these other items that have been banned um, or, or more heavily regulated by government over time. And I just think that helps prove the point that fluoride um, is, is, uh, is a substance that we should continue to have in our public water system. Tobacco, years of debate, but it was clear many, many years ago that that was harmful. That's killed a lot of people in this country, my mother included. Asbestos killed one of my best friends from college who worked for the EPA and probably took a breath at the wrong time when he was looking in somebody's basement at a burner. Um, yes, yeah, sodium fluoride has got poison on us, but if you had a big bag of aspirin, that probably ought to say poison because if I took 20 aspirin right now, I probably wouldn't be feeling too well myself. Lead, absolutely still a problem since 1977. Uh, that's been identified, so if you own an old historic home and you want to rent it to a family with children under six, you better have that deleted. Government's been all over that stuff. Um, radiation, nuclear power, um, hopefully he won't be able to talk tonight because he's chairing, but Councillor Connell back in the day was one of the leaders against Zebra. And, you know, I think the people on this council aren't afraid to take an unpopular stand, but we have to go where the science leads us. And the science says that fluoride in community water supplies has a beneficial impact. Councillor Herzog said earlier, that the people can't vote unless the council says so. Wrong. Charter. People can definitely put this on the ballot if they really want to. So just to cut right to the politics of this, um, we've seen a lot of letters to the editor, um, many of them from out of community, and I didn't have a chance to tabulate those. But the emails that I've gotten, and I think most councilors have gotten since November, uh, we've gotten a, a lot of email. I've gotten 25 emails. Uh, most of those were from Newbury reporters. In 17 of those emails were for keeping this off the ballot and keeping fluoride in the water system. And two of them, and Dave McFarland was one of those, sent us emails saying, put this on the ballot because we don't want it. So my public opinion poll is telling me 17 Newbury reporters in favor of keeping fluoride in the public water system and two against. And earlier tonight, when you cut out all the folks from other communities, whether they're for fluoride, or against it, it was uh, 14 speakers in favor of keeping this off the ballot and keeping fluoride in the water system, and six um, for taking uh, fluoride out and putting it on the ballot. So it was 14 to six. I'm voting no to keep this off the ballot. Uh, again, if the voters want it, they need to let us know. We'll get, take it up again, or they can petition us. And with, uh, with I believe, 12% of registered voters signing a petition, it could be on the ballot. So the power has always been with the people as it should be, and as their elected representatives, I'm glad that we've taken a lot of time to look at this, and I feel very, uh, very good about voting against this motion. Thank you. Councilor Tontar. Uh, the question before us is whether or not we're going to put this on the ballot. It's not um, whether or not fluoride is a, a, is a neurotoxin. And uh, I, I am not, in general, in favor of, uh, of a ballot process. I voted against putting the plastic bag ban on the ballot. Uh, the council had acted on that. Um, and this is different. I acknowledge that. However, for me, on two levels. One, in terms of the science uh, and, and the evidence that has been presented that I have looked at, um, it's overwhelming in one direction, all right? That fluoride serves a very positive function. Uh, you know, my father was trained in medicine prior to antibiotics. And there were a couple things he was obsessed with, and one was uh, healthy teeth. Right, uh, because it was critical, right, before antibiotics and before fluoride. Uh, that I, I had a cousin who was a World War II vet, a disabled vet, who was hospitalized. Uh, my father was a VA doctor, went to visit him, and said, Joe, have they checked your teeth? They had it. He had sepsis. He was dying, right, because of his teeth. And that was not, a, that, that, that happened. And that is happening much less. And I recognize there could be other factors. All right, but, and there's a second thing. A number of the public health officials, nurses and doctors that, who sent us letters, have noted that this is, it's, it's really a social justice issue. It's not just a, a scientific issue, all right? It's a question that, you know, sure, people could 
you know, and we could take it out of the water, um, and, um, and people who could afford it, right, and who are organized enough to do it and dedicated themselves to do it, would, uh, would provide fluoride for their children. But, but, you know, in the United States, that is not the case. That's why they, and, and then, the, you know, the World Health Organization, right, favors fluoridation. Right, um, and and I, you know, and I hear tonight that they don't, and that that I'm not sure that we're not having a little, you know, overstatement, right? Um, so on the science, right, it just doesn't rise to the level that I would be willing to put it on the ballot. And but secondly, politically, I have not heard a lot of Newberry reporters tell me they want this on the ballot. Right? So that, it, that I would take that step to put it on the ballot. Right? And as Councillor Cameron has noted, there is a process whereby citizens can put issues on the ballot. Right? Uh, and um, they haven't done that. So I am going to vote for no. no. Councillor? Any other discussion? Councillor Junta. I, um, just a couple of quick comments. I, I thought it, it's kind of um, interesting. Councillor uh, Kinsey said it. When we talk about plastic bags, we like to cite Europe and things going on there. And, and in this case, we cite Europe, but we don't really want to, we don't want to talk about that. And in the plastic bag debate, we talked about how it was going from town to town to town. Because the state wouldn't do it, but if it went from town to town to town, then the state would get the idea it's what the people wanted. Um, but again, we can't really talk about that issue either. Um, and then when we talk about issues of, um, you know, what the people of Newburyport wanted, um, it was overwhelming to me that um, people in Newburyport didn't want to ban plastic bags. I don't know how it was in other wards, um, but yet we didn't, we couldn't really bring that into the conversation here either with fluoride. I, I'm not a big proponent of either way. I, I am a big proponent of letting people have a choice of what they want in their water. Um, I actually, likely the people in your report are gonna vote to keep fluoride in their water. Because I think if they do enough research, that's probably the way they're gonna go. Um, but I'm never gonna take away somebody's opportunity to vote for what's in their own water. I just don't think that much of myself to make that determination for them. I think they should have the opportunity to vote for what's in their own life. Yes, sir. Uh, Councillor Hart, question. Thank you, Councillor. I'll be real brief. Um, I have a 13-year-old daughter, and I believe in science. I received an epidural when I gave birth. My daughter is 110% vaccinated, and I support fluoride in the water. Um, Fluorinated water has, sig has significantly reduced uh, te teeth decay, period. The research and evidence I have read overwhelmingly supports fluoride in the water as safe, valuable, most importantly, affordable. I am not in support of putting this on the ballot. We all know how campaigns can go and how they can be swayed. I also can't assume that every member of the voting public is going to research this topic to the degree in which I am required as a city councilor. I will be voting no to put this on the ballot. Thank you. Councilor, Councilor Cronin, excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll be brief as well. Um, if this were, and I'm going to stay on point of should this be on the ballot or shouldn't it be? Go ahead. And if this were any other question before us, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now because we don't have enough information on the question. The water district in Newberry, the water district in West Newberry, we don't have, a, we don't have even solid information if, if they should be allowed to vote or not. <coughs> um, just on that alone, I'm not gonna vote yes to put it on the ballot because we're, we're gonna disenfranchise a portion of our, uh, of our water district. Um, and then as I brought up in, in um, the little committee hearing before the, the, the meeting, is how does this even impact the troubles and travails that are going on in Plum Island right now? <coughs> are these people silent? 
I think it's something that has to be considered. So just on that alone, never mind that I'm, for myself, until this came before the uh, council, I was, it was under my radar as it, as it is right now. I, I don't mind it going on a ballot, but I would vote in favor of keeping fluoride. But with everything in front of us, I can't support this on a, on a ballot. Thank you, Council. Are there any other comments members would like to make? Councilor Genta. Do, do we know if the city of Newbury, or the town of Newbury needs to vote since they get water from us? I can't answer that. Councilor Herzog, perhaps you've done some research in this. Yeah, I can. And I'd like to, with your, uh, I'd like to just respond to two other points as well. First, we're regarding Newbury and West Newbury. I've been in touch with the town clerks in both Newbury and West Newbury. Um, kind of at the background, to, just to real briefly, how, what the connection is, um, what the relationship is. The relationship between the Newburyport Waterworks and Newbury and West Newbury started in the 1930s. It started, um, and how it started is the same relationship today. Newburyport provides water on a full-time basis to uh, the Newbury sections on, in Plum Island and in their old town. Newbury has a separate water supplier for Byfield. Um, Haley, uh, Leslie Haley, who's a town clerk in Newbury, she mainly went through all of the municipal election ballots from the 1950s through the 1970s. She did not find any ballot questions regarding fluoridation. I have asked her um, to inquire with her legal counsel, which she has, and I'm waiting to hear back on it, as to what Newbury's legal counsel suggests. Should my interpretation of the logic says that in 1967, Newbury Report voted yes, Newbury was automatically added. So logic says that if Newbury Report votes no, Newbury is out of it. Um, the water plant, the Newbury Report water plant can't, it would cost an extravagant amount of money to have one community have fluoride and another not have fluoride. Um, so that's on that. On, on West Newbury, we provide water to West Newbury on a, on a, as, a, as a reserve source, very part-time, only when their primary supplier is, um, is low. That usually happens during peak times of the summer. And I've actually talked with our mayor's office about that, and the mayor's office here is less concerned about West Newbury and more about Newbury. Um, has, that's where my focus has been. Um, real quickly, Mr. President, some councillors have suggested, uh, Councillor Cameron and Councillor Tantra in particular, have suggested a citizen petition. I'm all for a citizen petition. I like the idea of a citizen petition. I question whether that requires another talk with legal counsel. The charter has nothing to do with this because water fluoridation is governed by state law. It's Mass General Law, Chapter 111, Section 8C. And a citizen petition is allowed in communities, as it says, where the Board of Health has ordered an upward adjustment, where the Board of Health has ordered the water department to add fluoride. Well, I've been in touch with Bob Reese, our, our water, uh, our, our, our um, health director. And the health director and the city clerk spent time looking for those records from the 1960s that presumably would have ordered the upward adjustment subsequent to the people's vote or prior to the people's vote. Um, those records have not been found, which led to my query to legal counsel how to proceed. Um, if we had those records, my understanding of the law, if we had those records, the Board of Health upward adjustment vote in the 60s, sure, we could have a citizen petition. Without those records, I don't know if we can. Maybe we can. Um, and just real quickly, Mr. President, I get it, science, research, evidence. There is science, there is research, there is evidence that fluoride is bad. If there wasn't, then other boards of health would never have recommended the elimination of fluoride. Are there other comments? Councilor Eichmann. Uh, I, I'm sorry to take us later, but I, I need to respond to some of the comments by the Chair of Public Utilities. So, the short answer is we don't have an opinion from, from the city solicitor on what it means. We, we don't. We, we, they have not opined on whether if the voters of, of Newburyport act on this, what it means with Newbury and West Newbury. And, um, and then this, the second question that Councillor Cronin brought up about, well, we're having all these problems with our system on Plum Island especially, and it's very fraught. It's you know, kind of the elephant in the room. Nobody's asked those questions. I mean, let's, let's not kid ourselves. We haven't. Um, I, I don't quite follow the argument that, that uh, 
the voters can't put this on the ballot by 12% of the electorate. I, I, don't, I don't understand that. I mean, we're, we're, we either refer it to them and they vote on it, or they essentially take an initiative themselves and refer it to themselves. So I think that's a red herring. And I guess, you know, what I was trying to get at, I want to respond to Councillor Junta's comments. You know, I'm not taking away any of the voters' rights. If 12% if of the electorate of Newburyport feels this is so important, they should, they, should, they should absolutely circulate a petition and put it on just as they could with uh, plastic bags. But our job as the 11 <coughs> city council is to screen them and decide when we put things on the ballot. And you know, when would, when would we ever say no, I guess is the question. And I'm saying now is the time to say no. Let's not put this one on the ballot. It's not a compelling enough case. If 12% of the electorate thinks we're wrong, they have every right to overrule us. I think we've um, pretty much exhausted discussion on this matter. Um, I, uh, and you'll probably thank yourselves for the, your, your luck here. Um, if there was ever an issue that a lifetime science educator uh, was eager to discuss, um, this is the one, <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> Hearing no further discussion, and seeing no further inclination to prolong this discussion, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Okay, so and this the question is, is, please read the question. This is a motion to approve uh, the January 12, 2015 order that states as follows. City Council petitions the general court for special legislation pertaining to water fluoridation as attached. Submitted councilors uh, Hirsog and Kinsey, and it reads as follows. Would you like me to read the petition? Please. An act to place the local question, shall the public water supply for domestic use in the city of Newburyport continue to be fluoridated on the November 2015 biennial election ballot, section one. Notwithstanding section 8C of chapter 111 of general laws or any general or special law to the contrary, city of Newburyport is hereby authorized to include on the ballot for the November 3rd, 2015 municipal election the following question. Shall the public water supply for domestic use in the city of Newburyport continue to be fluoridated? Question mark, close quote. If the majority of votes in answer to this question is in the negative, the water supply of the city of Newburyport shall not be fluoridated. And the fluoridation of the water supply shall not be ordered again by the Board of Health for a period of at least two years from the date of that vote. Section one, this act shall take effect upon passage. That is the home rule petition, which is attached to the order. So I do a roll call, and the simple majority will prevail. Is that correct? That's correct. Just a point of order. Councilor Cronin. In, in the last paragraph here, it says, in, am I reading this wrong? In the majority of votes in answer to this question is in the negative. The water supply of the city. Sh OK, I'm sorry. I read it wrong. All right. I'm back with, I'm okay. Back with a little bit. OK. <laughs> right. so. so starting this roll call, again, this is a motion to approve. Councilor Hartquist? No. Councilor Hirsog? Yes. Councilor Kinsey? Yes. Councilor Tontar? No. Councilor Vogel? No. Councilor Cameron? No. Councilor Cronin? No. Councilor Eigenman? No. Councilor Junta? Yes. Councilor Connell? No. Three yes, remaining no's, motion fails. Thank you, Councilors. Councilor Herzog, is there any other matter you want to bring out of committee? committee you're still with the committee. I'd like to remove from committee nine, item number three, okay. which is the school's letter on fluoride. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Any discussion? Hmm. All those in favor of removing that letter from committee? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion to receive and file. Motion to receive and file. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Thank you. Thank you. Um, rules committee, there's nothing for the good of the order. Is there anything Sorry, that. There is. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> Counselor. Can you gavel these people, please? They're leaving. Let's go. Right. Um, thank you. I'm not going to stand up here and talk about how some Plum Island residents are experiencing sewer backup in their homes, out of their faucets. 
Could you please take your conversations outside the chambers? We'd like to get out of here by 11 o'clock tonight. Thank you. I'll Counselor? start again real quick. Thanks. I'm not going to stand up here and talk about how some Plum Island residents are experiencing sewer backup in their homes, out of their faucets, through their showers, or in their washing machines. Mm. Instead, I have been inspired by a Facebook post I read last week from an insightful, bright, and very witty resident by the name of Pam Brockmeyer Armstrong. She wrote a post thanking people, and I'd like to expand on that sentiment. I would like to take a few minutes and thank a few hundred people for their tireless involvement with the ongoing nightmare on Plum Island. Thank you, Tony Fanari and the entire yeah, EPS team. Can you, can you guys you please move down there? We can't hear a thing in here. Plowing, <laughs> shoveling, sanding, and salting the entire city. But thank you for unburying Plum Island over and over and over again. The winds have been unbearable and the snowdrifts have been unprecedented. Thank you, Tony, for also continuing to take my calls. For that, I am eternally grateful. Thank you for Code Red technology and for Code Red phone calls no matter the time of day or night. Thank you, Jamie Tucolo, and thank you for his AirVac team of eight. Thank you for working tirelessly 16-hour shifts seven days a week. Thank you for not losing your patience and for all your hard work. Thank you to the inventor of heated porta potty seats. <laughs> <laughs> it's the little things. Thank you to Mayor Holiday and Peter Lombardi. Thank you for dealing with my frustration, my anger, my impatience, and my demands. Thank you for taking my call late that fateful evening and for showing a constant sense of urgency. Thank you for continually communicating and being responsive and for coming up with quick solutions. Thank you for having all hands on deck and for not losing momentum. A huge thank you to Mima for helping with snow removal and for setting up the information center at Petta Hall. Thank you to Lieutenant Governor Polito for her continued assistance and constant communication with the city. A huge thank you to Lisa Velsic, I don't know if I'm saying her name right, who's been on the front lines dealing with complaints, cleanups, hotel assignments, and thank you to the entire water and sewer office staff. And last but certainly not least, thank you to all the Palm Island residents for their patience, strength, and sometimes sense of humor. And especially to all the residents who came together Thursday night and asked, what can we do to help? This has been an all hands on deck approach and I am thankful and grateful for the leadership and resilient residents we have in the city. Nice. Well said. Very nice. Thank you. <coughs> Councilor Cameron. I would also, uh, I'm sure, speak, I'm speaking for other councillors, uh, thank Councillor Harquist for your leadership. And we know you were banging the drum from storm number one, uh, not, not until storm number three when the rest of us got on board. But I know you, you've really done a heroic job. And, and, uh, for your thank, you. So, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Genta. I just wanted to send two more thank yous out there, one to the Red Cross and one to the Salvation Army. I'm, yeah. sure I'm, not, yeah. I'm sure they've been helping the folks from Plum Island and they were helping the folks on Low Street also. They certainly were. Anyone else? I'm going to um, perhaps violate an, a, a rule, uh, but perhaps in the, for the good of the order. Uh, I would like to, uh, number one, thank the counselors for their well-reasoned discussion of what was a uh, sometimes difficult issue. Uh, on fluoridation of water and putting it, whether or not to put it on the ballot. And number two, on a somewhat lighter vein, I'd like to acknowledge the success of the uh, boys indoor track team winning their fifth consecutive divisional championship without the services of their All-American miler. Um, as a former coach, um, the first championship's a thrill, the second's tougher. The third, fourth, and fifth are almost insurmountable. And um, Coach Foley and Coach Henniger deserve the thanks of the community. And those kids did us proud. Congratulations to them all. <coughs> if there are no further matters, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded? Thank you. Good night.